Hello everybody and welcome to this Django Complete course. Now in this video, I'm going to be covering all of the important aspects of Django that as a beginner you need to know. So from setting up a simple Django application to creating a database to having users log in, sign up and sign out to having user specific pages, that is what is going to be covered in this video. Now, just to make something really clear here, this video is a combination of 11 previous videos that I have on my channel currently. I decided to re-edit these videos just to have them be a little bit nicer and combine them all into one video because when I posted this series, it was probably about a year and a half ago, and I have a lot of new subscribers now that probably don't even know I have a Django tutorial series. So with that said, I hope you guys enjoy. If you do, make sure you leave a like. And with that said, let's dive in after a quick word from our sponsor. Before we get started, I need to thank the sponsor of this video, which is Algo Expert. Algo Expert is the best platform to use when preparing for your software engineering coding interviews and has the highest quality coding interview practice questions. With over 140 practice questions, detailed solutions in nine of the most popular programming languages, a feature packed browser based coding environment, extensive test suites and conceptual overviews and code walkthroughs for each and every problem. Algo Expert is the best resource to use to ace your coding interviews. Algo Expert also has a data structures crash course, coding interview assessments and a mock interviews feature. I can highly recommend Algo Expert as a former customer myself and now an official instructor on the platform. Get started using Algo Expert today by clicking the link in the description and using the code tech with Tim for a discount on the platform. Hey guys, and welcome to a new series, which is Django web development with Python. Now, if you haven't heard of Django before, essentially it's a full stack web framework, which allows you to create websites using purely Python and a little bit of HTML. Now, this is really awesome because typically when you want to create websites, you got to use a a combination of languages you got to use JavaScript HTML CSS all this kind of stuff PHP um, but if you already know Python this is a really nice and fairly simple way to actually create fully functioning websites and that's what I'm gonna be showing you throughout this series now this first video is gonna be dedicated to setting up our project understanding a bit about how Django works and getting the server kind of running on our local machine and then later in other videos we're gonna be working with databases templates making fully functioning websites and hopefully near the end I will work on a large project and show you guys how we can get everything set up to create an actual website that you might be able to use uh, so without further ado let's get started now the first thing that we're gonna need to do uh, when we're working with Django is we need to install it so I'm assuming you already have Python installed if you don't you're gonna have to go ahead and do that uh, but from there we need to install Django to do this we're simply just gonna open up our command prompt we can just type CMD in the little thing here and do pip uh, install and then Django like so now I already have this installed so I'm not gonna do this but if for some reason when you hit enter and this doesn't work it means or it says like pip is not in your path or something like that uh, click on the video that I'm gonna have a link there's gonna be a card to it and a link in the description it's called how to install Pygame but this goes through how to fix this pip issue so just watch through that video and it will explain to you how to fix this issue and when it you type Pygame when it says like type Pygame just type Django instead uh, and that should hopefully fix your problem now for me I'm actually working in a virtual environment uh, for Django don't this doesn't really mean anything to you don't worry about it so I'm just gonna activate that now but what we're gonna do to start our project is we're gonna create a directory somewhere accessible that we're gonna install all of our kind of Django stuff into so I've created one uh, in this kind of directory system here so desktop python youtube django tutorial so i'm just going to change into that directory by using cd so we'll cd into desktop cd python cd youtube and cd django uh django like that so now i'm in this directory but if you guys don't want to do that or it's a complex path all you can do is open it up your folder here and then type cmd and it'll open up a python or a cmd window that is in this directory like that for you Okay, so now that we've done that, what we need to do is we need to create a brand new Django project. Now to do this, what we're going to do is type Django hyphen admin and then start project, I believe that is, and the name of our project, which in this case, I'm going to call my site. Now you can name this whatever you want. However, if you try to name it the name of a Python package, so maybe like NumPy or site or something like that, it won't work. So if you get that error, just try changing the name to something else. 
So I'm going to do that. And now you should see inside of my Django tutorial folder, I have this new directory called my site. Now, if I go in here, we'll look through some of the uh, files that we have. So we have this manage.py file inside the root directory of my site. And uh, this is what we're going to be using to create applications, to run our server, uh, to do all kinds of stuff. So this is an important file to use. And then inside of my site, so the other directory, we have a few of these files like this. And I'm not going to go through what all of them do, but we will be modifying this URLs file later in the video. Okay, so that's a brief overview of what that is. So now that we've done that, we've actually created a Django uh, project. And we can test to make sure that this project is working uh, by just running a, uh, a server on our local machine that's going to allow us to connect to our uh, website. So right now, when all the stuff we're going to be doing is known as development. So essentially, we're just working on our local machine. Our website is not live on the internet, like not anyone can go to it. But when you run this, it's going to allow you to connect to it and view it as if it was live on the internet, but it's just running off our local machine. To do this, what we're going to do is we're going to type Python, or sorry, actually, one step before that, we need to change into this my site directory. So right here, we're in this directory now, we need to go into my site. So to do that, we're going to go CD my site. And now what we're going to do is we're going to run this manage Python file uh, with a few arguments. So to do this, we're going to do Python manage, if I do a space here, manage.py, and then we're going to say run server like that. So let's hit enter here. And what we're going to do is now we're going to start running a server on our local uh, port, which is actually 8080, which is going to allow us to connect and view our website. We don't have anything on the website yet, uh, but I will show you connecting to it. So to connect to this, what we're going to do is just copy this HTTP link here. Looks like a little IP address. And we're going to go to Google and simply paste that in the uh, bar up here. So when we do that, you should see a page that looks like this. If you don't see this page, rewatch uh, the last few minutes of the video and make sure you follow all the steps correctly because you should see this popping up. All right, so now that we have that, we'll leave that open. Uh, and I'll quickly mention that right now this is running on port 8080. If you, for some reason port 8080 is blocked or you want to run it on a different port, what you can do is uh, simply when you type that run server command, after run server, just type the port you want to run it on. So for example, if I want to run it on port 5050, I don't even know if that's a port, but you could just hit enter and then it would run on that port and it would give you a different address to connect to uh, the website. Okay. And also if you want to stop the server from running, which is what I did, I just hit control and C on the keyboard. Okay. So now we've got this, uh, we'll, we'll close this up for now and we'll look at that after what we're going to do now is create what's known as an app. Now, right now we haven't actually created an application or any views or any web pages for our site. We've just kind of set up uh, the environment that's going to be hosting that site for us. That's kind of a way to think of it. So if we want to create an application, which is what we're going to run from our uh, kind of environment to do this, we need to, uh, what do you call it? So we're already in this directory. We need to use this manage file once again to create that. So to do this, I'm going to do Python and then I'm going to go to manage manage.py and then type the name of, or sorry, start app after this and now type the name of whatever app I want to uh, to create. So in this case, I am just going to type uh, test as my app name, but you guys can type whatever you want. Actually, you know what? Let's change this to main. So now that I do this, I have Python manage.py start app and then I hit enter like this. Now you can see that it should create a new directory inside of our my site directory called main. Now it's very important that's in this directory. If it's not, um, there is other ways to access it, but it's not going to work for what I'm going to be showing you. So now we should have a directory system that looks like this Django tutorial. You have a folder called my site. You go in there, you should have main, which has a few files in here, which we'll talk about after. And then it has my site and uh, this manage dot manage Python file. Okay. So now that we've done this, let's rerun our server and connect to uh, that page. So to rerun our server, same thing, Python manage.py run server. And we'll do that. We'll copy this link once once more and just run this up here. All right. So there we go. So now everything is is working fine. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start modifying some of these Python files and actually displaying our own HTML code on the website. 
Now this is a bit of a process. Make sure you guys are following along for this because there is quite a few steps. And if you mess up one slightly, uh, it will result in a few issues happening in your uh, with your website and connecting and all that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a text editor. In this case, it's Subline. Um, you guys can use whatever you want as long as you can edit these files and just understand what I'm doing. So I like this just because it has the directory system on the left here, so I can easily navigate between stuff. So what I'm going to do, we'll close these up for right now is I'm going to start by going into my main folder and going into this views.py file. So this views file is what's going to actually store the different views for our application. Now a view you can kind of think of as a web page, and this is where we're going to write essentially the code that's going to serve what's known as HTTP requests and uh, show some stuff up on our website. Now to do this, the first step is to just import something. So we're going to say from uh, Django dot uh, dot http and then response we're going to import uh http response now i believe i probably butchered this yeah sorry so it's actually just django dot http um is that correct lowercase h my bad guys so django dot http import http uh, p response. Now down here, we're going to create a function and this function is going to represent a view. Now we can create multiple views here, but for now we're just going to stick with one and I'll be showing later on how we can connect different views and link to those and all that. So we're going to cite define index. We're going to put in here response. And then what we're going to do is we're simply going to return HTTP response. And in here, we're just going to type some text. Now you can type whatever you want. I'm just going to say tech with Tim in here. And this is actually our first view. Now what goes in here is uh, HTML code. If you don't put any tags, so for example, like I don't put H1 um, slash H1, it'll just show up as like standard text. But if you want to create a header or something, you can just do H1. And uh, I'll be talking about how to do more complex HTML stuff later. So that should be it for this file right now. And what we're going to do next is we actually need to create a new file inside of this main application uh, that's going to represent our URLs. And we'll talk about how all this works in a second. So I'm just going to create, create a new file here. So file, new file. And what I'm going to do is just make sure I save this and I'm going to call it urls.py, but it has to be inside of this main folder. So it should be in here. Okay, so urls.py. Now in here is where we're going to define the paths to our different web pages. And I'll, once we do the other, like there's another URL file we have to modify as well, but this one is going to represent the URLs that go to the different views that we have in this file. So for example, right now we have one view, but if we had another view, so like if I copy this and paste this down here, then we would have to define that inside of the URLs file with a certain path. So we can determine which view we're going to go to uh, based on whatever path the user types in uh, in the search bar at the top. Okay, so we'll go urls.py, and what we're going to do in here is we're going to say from Django uh, dot urls import path like that. Okay, and then in here we're going to say from dot views or sorry from dot import views. Now this essentially means just import views from the current like directory that we're in. Uh, so that's how we'll do that. And then in here, we're going to type URL And here. What we'll do is simply say path, and then we'll put a comma after that. And we're just going to type um, a blank string and then we're going to type views dot index uh, and then name equals index like that. Now, what this is going to do, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this more later because we have to do some other stuff first is essentially say, if we get into this application and we're just on the, the home page, so we don't type like slash home or just the home directory, we're going to go to the views.index page and that has the name of index. And what that means here is we're going to serve this HTTP response, which means that once we go to that page, it should show uh, tech with Tim in a header one on the page. Now, this will make more sense once we do the other URL file and I can show you how we kind of navigate through it. But for now, uh, just just have this typed in. So that's actually all we have to do from inside of this main folder. Now what we have to do is we have to link this application to our project. Now remember this this Django tutorial folder, right, is the project for our website. And this 
main folder inside here is the application that we're going to link to our project. It's a little bit confusing, but you guys should understand in a second. So what we need to do is we need to essentially set the URL that's going to link to this application because we can have more than one application inside of our project. So to do this, what I'm going to do is go to the URL files inside my site, and this should actually already be created for you. You should already have this code. And I'm simply going to modify this right here. So from django.urls, import path and import include. Now, after this path here, I'm going to copy this and paste this directly below it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I want to navigate to this application when the user types in a certain path. And what I mean by path is let's go to up here. Right now we have this, okay? But when I say path, I mean like if you type slash home, the path would be slash home, right? And we would have to know where to go if you type slash home. Just like if you go on a website and you do slash login or slash sign up, you get directed to different pages. So that's what we're doing right now. So maybe we have another page and it's called sign up or something like that. So we have to define when we type certain paths where we're going to go. And that's what we're doing right now. So we already have one path, which is known as admin. Now admin gives you like an admin dashboard and we'll look at that in later videos. But right now it's not super important, but we want to define the path that we should go to automatically um, when we type something. So right now I'm actually just going to leave this as blank. And what this means is if we don't type anything, so we just put in this main URL, bring us to whatever page I'm about to define here. So in here, I'm going to type include like this. And then what I'm going to do is in strings here, I'm going to go to main dot views. I believe actually, sorry, main dot URLs is the correct page there. So what this means now is if we don't type anything for our path, we will automatically direct ourselves to the main dot URLs file. Now the main dot URLs file is this one right here. And what it's doing here is it's going to look at what path we've been given. We'll talk about that in a second and then go to the appropriate view from this views file here. Okay. So it's, we're linking from multiple different files. We're sending paths and all that stuff. Okay. But if we look at the urls.py file here under my site, what this include actually does is it means, okay, we're going to look for a path. Um, that specifies whatever's in this string. So in this case, it'd be admin. In this case, it's nothing. It's just the default path. And what we're going to do is we're going to take everything after that path and we're going to send it to the main.urls page. So for example, if our path, and I'll type it down here, uh, looks like whatever the IP address is, and then like slash home slash start, and we had slash home here, okay? What we would do, or we'll do home slash like that, sorry, is we're going to look for the this home path here. So we find this, we find home. Okay. And once we find this, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, so we'll get rid of this because we found that and we'll take start like that and we'll pass it over to this urls.py file inside of our main application. Cause it says go to main urls, right? And now what main urls is going to do is it's going to look for uh, a path that's called start because it gets past start like this and it's going to see, okay, do I have any path that says start? Now, if it does, it's going to direct us to whatever function inside the views uh, file that we've defined. So if I add another path here, okay, and I define this and I say this is start with a forward slash, so let's say that has a forward slash too, then what will happen is we will go to the views.index view because that's the path that we typed in. Now, in this case, uh, we're just going to leave it as a blank path, which means that if you had nothing um, just like that, it'll just automatically go to this path. You guys should understand this in a second once we start actually doing it. Wait, okay, so we've done this now. Uh, so I actually, I don't know if we're going to have to restart the server or not, but let's just hit enter one more time in the search bar and see what we get. Okay, so we get now tech with Tim in the header one tags. Now, I know I kind of went a little bit faster through this and it might be a little bit hard to understand, but we'll create another page now and I'll show you how this actually is working. So um, we've done that. Let's leave this open. So essentially, right, this is what was shown. We had inside this views.py file, we had this index function and it returned h1 tags tech with Tim. Now, what I'm going to do is just create another function. I'm going to copy this and I'm just going to call this, uh, let's say v1. Okay. And in here, instead of tech with Tim, we'll just say uh, view one. 
exclamation point. Okay. So now let's show how we could possibly navigate into a different view using this kind of URL structure that we've set up. So remember this URLs inside of my site defines what's going to happen when we go to a certain link, what page we're going to direct into. So uh, I had this as blank before. So what happened is if you don't type anything after the main URL, which is like that HTTPS, it's just going to direct us to the main dot URLs and it's going to include whatever comes after uh, this blank uh, tag essentially. Okay. So if we want to make it so we could possibly go into another, uh, what do you call it? File folder, whatever, or another view. What we can do is add another URL inside of this URLs dot pi. So I'll copy this path and instead of having a blank this time, I'm going to say slash V one, or I'm going to say, sorry, V one slash forward slash. And now instead of going to the views.index view, I'm going to go to views.v1. Remember the name of our function. And again, I'll call this a different name, which will be view1. All right. So that hopefully this will make sense. If we don't type anything, so meaning we like we don't type admin, what's going to happen is whatever the path that we've given is going to be passed over to this urls.py file. If it's blank, meaning we haven't typed anything at all other than the main URL, it's going to bring us to the index page. If we type V1, it's going to bring us to the V1 page. So let's try this on our web browser. If I change this now and I say slash V1, you can see that it brings me to the page V1. Now, remember, if I get rid of V1 and I hit enter, it brings me back to the page tech with Tim. So we successfully set up two pages that we can see and we kind of understand now how this URL directory system works. So that's all it is um, to setting up our basic Django pages. Uh, in the next video, we'll do a bit more on some multiple pages. We'll talk about creating some actual like real HTML stuff on the website uh, and just keep going further and further with Django. If you guys enjoyed the video, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. If you need any help, uh, don't hesitate to join my discord server. Follow me on Twitter or my Instagram. I'm always answering people's questions there. And with that being said, I will see you in the next. So in today's video, what we're going to be doing is going through databases. So how to set up databases, add entries, retrieve entries, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this will be kind of a beginner ish tutorial on databases. I'm not going to be going through absolutely everything as there's a ton of stuff to cover, but I will give you guys a very good foundation and pretty much everything you actually need to be able to use the database. And then obviously you could probably look up some more stuff if you need that in the future. Now the database that we will be using is SQ 3. Now there is other kinds of databases that you can use, but if you're a beginner and for our purposes, SQLite is just the best and easiest to use. It doesn't really make a massive difference if you use the other ones. However, if you'd like to use those, go ahead and I will be showing you briefly how you can actually change your database. Now, the reason I'm not going into templates and more advanced HTML right now is because likely the information that we're storing in our database is actually what we're going to be wanting to show within our models uh, or sorry, not models within our templates and HTML. So it kind of makes sense to make the information first and then display it afterwards within templates and all that. So we're not uh, kind of redundantly typing things and modifying things later. So with that being said, let's get started. Now, our first step when we're going to be working with the database is we actually need to modify uh, our settings.py file inside of our interior my site directory. Now to do this, obviously, we're just going to go to settings.py. What we need to do is we need to scroll down to installed apps. We need to add our application in this case called main for me to our installed apps. And the reason we need to do this is because when we're going to be working with databases uh, and just some things in the future, we need to tell Django that we have another application that has some dependencies and things that need to be set up uh, inside of our project. So to do this, what we're going to do is just go single quotes right at the end of this. Uh, what do you call it? Wherever the comma is. And we're just going to type the name of our application. In this case, mine's called main. Yours might be called something else. And then we're going to type dot apps dot and then main config uh, and then add a comma after that. Now, obviously, if yours is named something else, you're going to change this. So you'd add a capital letter for whatever the name is. And then, yeah, just put it there and, and that'll work for you. Okay, so we've done that. And now we've told Django that we actually have this application main and we need it to be configured and set up when we uh, make some modifications to our project and stuff like that. So our next, the next thing that we actually have to do is we need to get into our my site directory. So the same directory that has that uh, manage.py file in it. And we have to run the following command, which is Python 
manage.py and then migrate. Now, when you type this, uh, what do you call it? Yours might, yours should likely pop up like a bunch of text that says making migrations, making changes. Now, since I've already done this, uh, cause I was testing it before, uh, it's not showing up for me, but you should do that. What I've just done here essentially is said we've updated the settings.py file. So let's run manage.py and get it to make any changes to the project that it might need to do. And that's as far as I'm kind of going to explain that. All right. So we've done that. And now we're actually ready to start defining some of our models for our database. So if you don't know how to, a database works, essentially it's just a collection of information. And what we're going to be doing is defining some models and some attributes that kind of go with each of the models. And the model is just a way of, well, modeling information and it makes it just easier for us to grab information and we can add attributes to those models. We can add some methods to them. Uh, you guys will see how it works in just a second. But essentially, if we want to create a model, what we're going to do is we're just going to create a class with the name of our model and we're going to inherit it from models.model, which is uh, like a database model class set up from Django already. Now for this application that I'm going to write, I want to create a to-do list. So to do this, I'm going to create two models, one which is a to-do list, and then the other one which is items that go on our to-do list. And you guys will see how this works in a second. So I'm just going to say class to-do list uh, like this, and it is going to inherit from models.model. Now this essentially means that we're creating a database object, uh, which is called to do list. And now we're going to define some of the attributes and entries that each model to do list is going to have. So, uh, for our to do list, I want to have a name. So I'm going to say name is equal to, and in this case models dot char field, and I'm going to say max underscore length equals 200. Now, whenever we create a new attribute or, uh, yeah, I guess just attribute of our information of our model. What we do is we create it as a class variable and we simply do the name of the attribute and then we have to do the type of field that we want to be stored in our database. All right, guys, I'm back. So I'm going to take a quick cut there because I was getting a phone call. But what I'm going to do now is just to find a method. Uh, we'll just call this str and I'm just going to put self in here and simply return self.name just so that if we ever want to print this out or see what it actually looks like, we can get some meaningful text by using the string uh, method on that. So next, what we're going to do is define our other model, which is item. So same as before, this will inherit from models.model, .model, and this is going to have some attributes as well. Now, item is a little bit different just because it's actually related to to-do list, and we're going to have items as a part of our to-do list. So to do this, uh, again, right, what we're going to do is simply say to do list equals, and in this case, we'll say models dot foreign, uh, foreign key. And then in here, we're going to type to do list like that. And we're going to say on delete equals uh, models dot cascade. Now, the reason we're doing this is because Remember how like up here we have character field, right? Which is a type of field that we could store uh, information in. Well, we don't actually know the type of field or Django doesn't know the type of field that to do list is because it's an object that's not defined within Django. So we have to define the fact that we're going to use a foreign key in this case, a to do list object when we create an item. Okay. And that's what we're doing now on delete is just saying, well, if we delete to do list, since all items exist on a to do list, we're going to have to delete these as well. And I believe that's what on cascade is doing is just defining the fact that this has a special way of being removed. Okay. So our next attribute is going to be name. So I'm going to say, or sorry, not name, it'll be text and text is going to be equal to a character field as well. And a character field is essentially just a string. Uh, note that you do need this max length whenever you create a character string. So make sure you add that in this case, let's just make that 300. And now we will add one more field, which will be a Boolean field. So models, dot boolean field and it'll just represent whether or not we've completed the item on our to-do list same thing here for string uh, so self and we'll just return the text so return self dot text now remember in the future we can add to these models and modify them so for now i'm just keeping it simple uh, we don't need anything too complex all right so now that we've done that we've modified our models we actually have to tell django that we've modified our models. And to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure we're in that same directory. So my site, we're going to say Python 
uh, manage.py make migrations. And in this case, we'll put the name of our app, which is main. Now, uh, yes, that's okay. So this should work. And let's hit enter here and see what we get. All right, so there we go. So now when you do that, you should see something that says migrations for and then the name of your app, which should be main and says we created a model to do this and we created a model item. Now making migrations is similar to like adding something to the staging area in Git. If you don't know what this is, don't worry, but it's similar to version control in that we make a change, it'll save the change and then we can actually apply that change to our project. So if I want to apply this change right now, I've only made it. I haven't actually applied it. What I have to do is go Python manage.py and then migrate. And there we go. It says applying migrations and it has applied the migrations. And you should see if you go inside of your migrations folder inside of your app, you should get something that looks like this. And you can see if you actually open it up, it tells you the exact migrations or changes that were made in case we have ID uh, ID is automatically added for all of the different models that you create as a field. We have the name, which is a character field. We have text complete and to do list. There we go. So um, that's kind of how that works. It's nice because you can go back and view previous changes and then obviously revert to other changes by just using those files. Uh, so yeah. All right, so now that we've done that, what's actually next is to add some things into our database. So right now we have a fully functioning database and I'm going to show you how we can add stuff to it. Now, the easiest way to show you is just from the command line because we'll just mess around with a few different commands, get the syntax down and then start doing stuff from code. So to get into uh, a command line, what I'm going to do is just go uh, Python manage.py and then shell. This will open up our Python shell for us, which will allow me to add some things into the database. Now, our first step is we're just going to import our models so that we can use some of the methods and we can actually use those models to create objects and store them in the database. So I'm going to say from, and in this case, main.models, because we're not in that main directory, we'll import, uh, what's the name of our models? We have item and we have to do list like this. There we are. So from, from main.models import item and to-do list. And now what we're going to do is we're going to create a to-do list and add it to the database. And this is really easy to do. So I'm just going to say T, which is going to be our to-do list will be to-do list. And then in here, I'm just going to give it a name and I'll say name equals. And in this case, let's just say Tim's uh, like that list. Sweet. So Tim's list and hit enter. Now, if we want to save this into the database, watch how easy this is t.save. And we have actually now saved this into the database. And if I want to see all of the different objects, what I can do is I can say to do list. Uh, if I can get the capitalization correct dot objects dot all. And if I do that, you can see we get a query set and it says to do list Tim's list. And there we go. We've successfully stored one to do list in our uh, database. So to get all of the to-do list that we have, I just did objects dot all and obviously dot objects is just giving all the objects and dot all is actually going to give me like a query set, which will allow me to access objects. Now each of our objects have IDs associated with them and they have that name attribute associated with them. So if I want to see the ID of some of my objects, what I can do is I can say to do list um, and I believe I can say dot get and then in here, I can say ID equals. And then in this case, the ID is going to start at one and it's going to increment as you add more objects. But if I do that uh, type object to do list has no attribute get. Hmm. Oh, I believe we might have to do dot objects dot get dot objects dot get. Ah, there we go. So if I do dot objects dot get and I put the ID, which is the thing that I'm looking for ID one, you see, we get a to do list and it says Tim's list. Now, if we didn't put that string uh, thing here, string method inside of to do list, it wouldn't be saying Tim's list. It would be giving us like a memory address. Awesome. So we have that. Now, if we want to query by like name, so what this is doing querying just means like getting all of the objects that contain the key you're putting. What I can do is just say name equals in this case and say Tim's list like that. And obviously it's going to give me Tim's list. Now, if I try to query for something that's not, that doesn't exist, like I say ID equals two, you see, we get an issue because there's no query that exists for ID two. If I wanted that to work, I would have to add another item into the database. Sweet. So that's 
kind of how you do some of that. Now, if we want to create an item, what we can do for items is actually really nice is we can just let's see the best way to actually make an item is hmm, let's see this. We're going to do T dot. And in this case, we're going to say item underscore set. And if I print this out I do dot all like this, you're going to see we get an empty query set. Now, notice I did item underscore set, right, which would be um, an attribute of our to do list uh, T, right, because we created a to list here, we saved it. Uh, so the T object is still there. But I said item underscore set, but I haven't defined item underscore set in here. What this is, is because I've added this relation between items and to do list, each to do list automatically is going to have a set that stores a bunch of different items. Okay, so now the way that we add items into our database is a little bit different than how we create the to do list. Now because our items are related to our to do list, there's a special way that we can create them and create them within our to do list. So essentially, remember, we had that to do list T, I just um, tab down so it's a bit more space and it's cleaner. But uh, we had that object T. And if I printed that, you can see that's our to do list, Tim's list. Now, because of the relationship we've created here, what I can actually do is say Tim underscore and then what item underscore set dot all. And it actually gives me a set of items which are exactly these items. And you just reference all of this with automatically with a lowercase. That's what it defaults to. And yeah, so essentially there is like a blank placeholder for our to do list to hold a bunch of items because of what we did here. So if we want to create an item inside of this item set, what we do is we say T dot item underscore set dot create. And then in here we give the parameters that we need for our item. So we need a text and we need complete. So what we'll do is we'll say text equals, and then in this case, we'll just say uh, like maybe go to the mall, something you have to do, and complete obviously will be equal to false. Okay, so we do that. And now we see we have an item that says go to the mall. So we've done that. Now we've created an item inside of our item set. Now if I do t dot item underscore set, and then dot all, you can see that we get all of the items. And obviously, if I want to get one of the items, then I can say dot get. And in this case, it'll be ID one. So I say ID one, go to the mall. Again, if I try to do ID two, we're going to run into an issue because ID two does not exist. All right. So now that we've created uh, one item or we've created an item in a to do list inside of our database, what we can do is we can actually display that information from some of our views and start using the web browser to see this information. So the reason I did that from the command line is just because it was a lot, it's going to be a lot faster just to run that and actually add items to our database. Obviously, if we're adding things into our database in future videos, we're probably just going to use our web browser and we'll have like a form where we can input stuff and it'll automatically be added. And that's obviously what we'll be doing later. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my views now and I'm actually just going to get rid of view one, which means that if I go to URLs, I should remove the path v one. Now, what I want to do is I want you to be able to type the ID of a certain to do list in the address bar and it pop up the name of the to do list and the items that exist in that. So to do that, uh, I will briefly show uh, a cool thing that we can do with paths and we'll, we'll elaborate on it in future videos. But essentially, I can actually put these two tags in here and say int. And in this case, I'll just say IND or ID standing for ID. And what this means now is what's going to happen is we're going to look for some integer in our path and we're going to pass that to the function views.index. So that means that index now needs a variable called ID in it. And what I can do is, well, I'll show you basically without the database actually, is if I just put like percent ID and then, or percent S, sorry. And then outside here, I do percent sign ID. It will actually, what do you call it? Show me whatever number I type in in my, what do you call it? Like on my web browser. Uh, so I closed the command prompt. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, one second. I just got to CD into my correct directories here. Uh, Django CD my site. And then we will just simply run our server so we can test this and I can show you what I mean. So let's do Python manage.py run server. Uh, I got to activate my virtual environment. Apologize about this guys. 
Okay, so there we go. So we've got this running now. So let's go to our web browser and let me show you what I mean by this. So if I hit this now, you can see we get an issue because it says that it didn't find admin or it didn't find some integer, which was an ID. So now if I type one in here, so like slash one, you can see it actually brings me to a page that says one. And if I type three in here, it brings me to a page that says three. If I type four, we get four. And actually anything that we type in that's a number will just show up in here. So we do like four, eight, like it shows up there. Okay. That's like the first kind of way that we can do dynamic pages in terms of the linking. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I have this ID obviously. So I don't want to just show the ID, but I want to get the ID of that object as a to-do list from our database. So to do that, what I'm going to do is similar to what I've shown you in the command line is I'm start, I'm going to start by importing our models. So in this case, I can just say from dot models import. And then in this case, we'll just import to do list because actually we might need item as well. So we'll, we'll import item as well. So we'll do to do list and item. And what I'm going to do is get that to do list based on the ID. So I'm going to say that uh, I'll say LS is equal to to do list dot objects dot get and then in this case we'll say id equals id right so now we have that to-do list object and now instead of printing the id let's print uh what do you call it the name of our to-do list so i can just say ls dot name so now we should have made a modification and it should have just our servers running it should have just automatically changed let me just copy this link again and if i bring up my tab uh, oh, it's already there. So if we do this and just change this ID to one, now you can see that we actually get Tim's list because again, the way this works is we go to URLs, we type some number, it gets that number, it passes it through this function as the value ID. We're just going to say, we're going to go a similar thing we did in the command line. We'll to do list. We'll get all of the objects of type to do list. We'll get the one that has ID one. And then we will simply take the name of that and print it to the screen or show it on the screen. Now, again, I could change this from ID and I can make it name and I can make the name like Tim's list. So you'd have to type that in to get it. So, I mean, we can show that as well. So in this case, let's just do string and then we'll do name. And now we'll just have to make sure that when we type it in our link bar here that we actually type everything correctly and make sure I save all this too. Uh, we type the name exactly like this. So if I copy that, and I put this here, you can see that again, it's showing up Tim's list and we're not running into any issues. But if I try to do like two here, you can see that we're getting an issue because there's nothing with the name two in our database. Awesome. So that's pretty straightforward. That's how we get items and show them on the screen. In the next video, we'll do way more advanced stuff with this. But if I want to get the items that are associated with the to-do list and show those as well, well, what I can do is, uh, well, let's go back to, uh, no, we'll just leave it as name because we don't need to change it now. We'll get the items. So to get the items, we're going to say items equals, and then in this case, to do list or actually LS, because we've already got the to do list dot item underscore set, uh, and then dot all. And then what we can do is we, well, we know we only have one item. So let's just get the first item. So I guess we just do dot get and then ID equals one. And what we'll do is change this percent. We'll add another one and we'll simply say, item dot name or items dot name, I guess uh, this should probably just be item. Let's say item dot name or dot text. My apologies. Okay. So now that we have item dot text here, we got to add another percent in here. So I'm just going to put another tag. I'm just going to say BR and then what do you call it? BR just standing for go to the next line and we'll add another tag. This case is just going to be a P, a P tag and we'll just put percent S like that. So now if I go back to my bar here and instead of doing T, I do Tim's list and I hit enter. Hmm. What's the issue? All right. So I just realized we actually have to just put this string around item dot text. Don't know why that is, but apparently that was the issue. So anyways, now if I go back to my web browser and refresh, you can see we set, we get go to the mall. Now, obviously this is a very basic example. I'm going to make this look a lot better in next videos. And we're not going to have to do like this kind of weird, HTML tagging and whatnot. Uh, but that's kind of been it for this video. I hope you guys have an idea on how to use databases. We'll be continually using them, adding things and removing things and all that kind of stuff. So if you are still confused, we will be going through that in future videos, but I just want to make sure we get everything set up and working for right now. 
And with that being said, I will see you guys in the next video. Now today's video is going to be a bit shorter and all I'm going to be doing is showing you guys how to use the Django admin dashboard. This relates directly to databases and how you can see all of your different tables and entries and all of that. I'm going to be quickly showing you a few more things you can do with databases in terms of how to delete stuff and how to get um, like lists of entries. So for example, say you wanted to sort all of the entries or say you wanted to get all of the entries that started with a certain letter or something, I'll show you how to do that. This is known as querying and there's a ton of different commands for querying. So I'm not going to be showing you all of them, uh, but I'm sure you guys can look them up or we'll probably be using them throughout the series. So you will learn them. Now I'm in my main directory right now, my, my site directory. The first thing I'm going to do is just quickly uh, extend what I did in the last video and show you how you can get a list of different entries and add more than one, because this will be good when we go in the admin dashboard uh, to see more than one entry. So I'm just going to do Python manage.py and then shell. And what I'm going to do in here is again, import, uh, what do you call it? Our models. So from main.models import, and then here we'll do item and we'll do to, to do list like that. And now what we're going to do is I'm going to get all of the items in to do list and show you how we can kind of search for certain items. So I'm just going to say T equals to do list dot objects dot all like that or actually let's just do dot objects so now we don't have to keep typing that we can just type t when we want to say for example get all of the objects we can just do t dot all like that uh, and then we get a query set that gives us all of the objects but let's say we want to search for an object and before we knew how to get one using like the id equal to one but what if we want to get all of the objects in our set that start with the letter t or that start with tim or something like that well, there's a way to do that and it's known as filtering. So if we want to filter our query set and get all of the uh, objects or all of the data that fits a specific uh, criteria, we can say t.filter and then we can name the criteria. So in this case, I could say name and then I believe you can just do under underscore starts with equals and in this case, Tim. So there's a ton of like, there's a ton of these double underscore things that you can use. I don't know all of them. You'd have to look them up to get them all. But if I do this and I hit enter, you can see that we get the same set because obviously this starts with Tim. Now, if I do this again and I say like maybe Bob, you see, we get an empty query set. And this is a way that you can check if a specific element you're looking for is in the set rather than trying to get it and raising an exception. So for example, if I want to get something that has ID equal to two and I filter that rather than getting an error, we just get an empty query set because none of the IDs are equal to two, right? So that's how we can kind of check if uh, what we're looking for actually exists in the database. So that's how you get stuff. Now to delete stuff is pretty straightforward. You just have to actually get that database object first. So I'm going to say Dell underscore object is equal to and in this case we'll say t dot get id equals one now if i want to delete this very simple we'll just do del underscore object dot delete like that and if you hit enter we will delete this object so now if i type t again um sorry t dot all you can see that we have an empty query set because we've obviously deleted the to-do list that we've added so let's just create two more to-do lists really simply. And we'll just say T, uh, T1 equals to-do list like this. And we'll just say name equals first list. And then we'll do T1.save. And then we'll do the same thing here with, uh, what do you call it, T2. And we'll just call it second list. Just so this way, when I start doing the admin dashboard stuff, which will be in one second, um, then we'll be able to see more than one entry. So we'll say second list and then T2 dot save like so won't bother any adding any items. That's actually it. If you need to get out of this, you can just type quit like that. And there we go. All right. So now we've added some things into our database. So let's go to our admin dashboard now. So how do we do that? Well, our first step to accessing the admin dashboard is to create a login account. So right now, if we actually run our server and we say Python manage.py run server, uh, server will start running. We can copy this domain here and we can go to it. Now, remember, we actually have this uh, directory or uh, link, which is slash admin. And when I do this, it actually brings me to this Django admin dashboard. 
The thing is though, what username and what password should we use? Well, we don't have any, so we need to actually create one. So I'm going to stop running this for a second. And what I'm going to do is create a uh, login. So I'm going to say Python manage.py and then I believe it is create super user. Yeah, it is. So there we go. Create super user. And then in this case, what we'll do is just give a username, email and password. So I'm going to put Tim as my username. I'll say Tim at tech with Tim.net. And then for a password, I'll just do one, two, three, four for now. All right. Uh, password is too short. Okay. Okay, so I'll just use another password then. Um, what is it? What is it saying here? Bypass password. Okay, so it just said that's fine. I can use that as a password. Anyways, let's uh, now try to sign into our admin dashboard and actually see what we're getting. So let's say Tim and then my password and click login. And you, oh, well, it would help if I ran the server. My apologies on that. Let's run that. And now let's refresh this, continue. And there we go. We are now inside of our app and dashboard. Now we have this groups and this users database, which is actually storing, if I go to users, the users that we just created. So Tim, for example, right? And that's one database that's there. Uh, same for groups. This, this is a bit different. We, we don't need anything for that. Now the thing is, where's our other database? We created that database and we've been using it that has our to-do list in it. Well, we actually need to give the dashboard uh, kind of access to that database. This is really easy to do, uh, but I'm just going to open up my subline text again here. And what we need to do to do this is go to what do you call it? Our uh, I believe it is admin.py inside of what do you call it? The main application folder here. All right, so we just have to start start by importing our models. So, so from models import, and in this case, we can just import the model that we care about in this case, which is to do list because items are going to be stored within a to do list. And then we just do admin dot site dot register. And then in this case, we do to do list, which means that now we will actually be able to see the to do list on our admin site. Uh, so that's, that's all we have to do for that. So now this should actually automatically have updated, but it may not have. Yeah, it did not. So let's just rerun our server quickly. Oh, there we go. It says reloading. Okay. So now this should hopefully be updated. If I refresh this work, 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 uh, I guess not. Okay. So let's just try this again. Slash admin. Okay. So there we go. Sorry. I've just, I've been messing around. So now I'm back slash admin. And now you can see that under main, which is our application in main, we have the database and model to do list. So if I open this, you can see that we have first list and second list. Now, this is a quick way as well. If you want to change elements or delete stuff, you can go in here and obviously you can just click delete or you could save stuff. You can see the history of it uh, and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of how the admin dashboard works in terms of viewing your databases. I figured I would just quickly show this to you guys because it's a really useful tool to make sure that what you're doing is actually working properly. But remember, if you create a new application or you're creating a new model, you have to actually add that and register it from within your admin.py file inside of your application. So if I wanted to add the items, for example, then I would have to do item, the item model, and I would have to import item. So let's just try that quickly and make sure everything's working with that. Wait for this to uh, refresh here. If I do this, let's go fresh. All right, maybe we'll just end it and then reload it. Oh, and all right, it says it reloaded. So let's try this. If I go here and I refresh this. Now you can see we have items. And if I go to items, obviously there's nothing because we don't have any items. So anyways, that's been the admin dashboard. In the next video, we're going to go into templates, which will be a much longer video on dynamically showing these kind of this information on our website. So today's video, what we're going to be doing is covering templates. So templates are essentially a way to make your HTML actually look good and display it on the screen. They're really nice in Django because you can actually put your own Python code and you can pass variables through to your templates, which means that you can make dynamic HTML, which will change based upon whatever you pass to it, which is really nice. So it's a really easy way to connect your kind of back end with your front end. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people obviously love Django is because of the fact that you can do stuff like this. Now, I just want to quickly go over what I'm going to be doing in the rest of the series. For some of you that were asking, I have plans to make a video on how to add a proper sidebar to your website, how to do forms, because forms are actually their own thing that are kind of complicated in Django, but I want to do a whole tutorial on that. 
I want to do user registration, so like login, register, um, sending emails, all that kind of stuff. And then obviously near the end of the series, we'll get into more videos, uh, longer videos where I'm not just doing features, but I'm kind of working on development of the website and actually probably hosting it using Heroku or something like that and showing you guys how to actually deploy this and hopefully for free online. So if you guys are excited about that, please make sure you're leaving a like on the video and letting me know in the comments. And with that being said, let's get started with templates. Now, if you remember where we left off, we had it so essentially we could view different parts uh, or different to-do lists from our database by typing the integer into our bar. And that's really all that we had. Now, what I'm gonna do in this video is create templates which will allow us to see our to-do list on the screen in somewhat of a nice form. And in future videos, I'll add bootstrap onto the website and start doing some custom CSS classes and stuff. But for now, we're just gonna use plain HTML and then we'll design and style it all after uh, because styling is really a pain and it takes a long time. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I wanna create a home page for my website. So right now we have this, um, this page where you type a number, you can see it, but we don't have any home page. So let's do that first. So I'm gonna add a link here which is just a blank string and I'm going to do views dot home and name equals home like this. And then inside of our views file here, so views dot pi, I'll create a new function called home. So define home and then we'll have response and we don't have any variables. So that's fine. And in here, I'm just going to pass for right now as we're not finished coding that yet. Okay, so templates. So right now what we've been doing is we've been uh, passing HTTP response to our views. So that's the way that we're, we're literally putting the HTML in here. Like you can see the tags right now. This is obviously not an efficient and not scalable way to make a website. So what we're gonna do is write our own HTML files and then we're gonna load them up from here, actually render them and display them to the screen. So that's what we have to do first. So the first step to do that is to actually create a directory called templates inside of our application directory. So inside of main here, I'm going to go to new folder and call this templates like so. So if we go in main, now I got this folder called templates. And now inside of this folder templates, I'm going to create a new folder called main. Okay. Now this might seem kind of weird how we have main and we have templates and we have main, but it just, the way the Django works, it's really weird. I don't really want to explain it is you just need a folder inside here with the same name as your application to load the templates. So that's what we're going to do. So now inside of this folder is where we're going to put our actual HTML files. So let's create a new file and let's just start coding some HTML. Uh, and I'll talk about what this is going to be compared to our other templates. So let's just set up an HTML document here, uh, slash HTML. And you know what, let's save this as base dot html and we'll talk about why i'm calling this base in just a minute so in here now i'm going to add some head tags uh, like that and then we add some body tags like that so inside of our head we'll simply just start by adding a title we will be adding a lot of other stuff into this later in the video but for now we're just going to keep it nice and simple for demonstration purposes so i'm just going to call this tim's website and then inside of my body tags i'm just going to create a paragraph tag and we'll just call this um, base template, okay? So that's all we're gonna do for now inside of that template. And let's create one more template inside of here. And this one we're gonna call home, okay? So if I save this and I say home.html like that and hit enter, then in here, I'm going to talk now about template inheritance. So a really nice thing with Django that makes building websites super scalable is they have something called template inheritance. Now, right now I've created this template and I've called it base.html. What I want this template to be is, well, the base or the standard layout of every single one of my web pages. So for example, you know, okay, so let's just go to uh, Instagram or something and I can show you what I mean by a base template uh, in terms of this. So for example, a base template for Instagram is this like bar up at the top, like every page you go to has this, or at least on the website, right? It has this Instagram, it has a search bar, and then it has these icons. And then obviously it's gonna be different depending on what page you are or what account you're on, what it's gonna show. But the base template would be like this top aspect, okay? So what I wanna do is create a base template, which will have something that'll be on all of my web page. So for example, on my actual website, if I go to uh, uh, techwithtim.net, you can see that this 
up at the top here, this bar would be, and uh, actually, what do you call it? This logo thing as well is the base template. It's on every single page. So what I want to do is make sure that I don't have to actually code that in to each HTML file that I make. Because think about it, if you have like hundreds of HTML files, I don't want to have to code in that menu bar every time. So what we're going to do is we're going to code all the stuff we want in always on the website in what's known as a base template. And then we're going to inherit that template with just one line of code from all of our other templates. So this one's our base, and this is going to show up on all of the pages unless we override it from the child templates. So to actually inherit this base template, what we do is uh, we use the kind of the Django syntax here, which is we open and close a curly brace it, and then we put 2% signs like this. And inside of here, we type extends, and then we're gonna actually put in single quotes, main slash, and then in this case, base.html. Now we just need to include main here because inside the main folder, and what this means is just like in Java extending a class, you're going to extend this template, essentially take everything from this template and use it here. Now you're going to say, well, how do I change stuff in here? Well, we're going to get to that in a second, but let's demonstrate this first. So now that we've done that, uh, what we need to do is actually render and use these templates. So I got to go back into views here. And right now you can see that all we're doing is returning this HTTP response. So what I need to actually do is render my template. So to do that, I'm going to remove HTTP response. We're actually not going to use that anymore. We're going to use the keyword render. And then here we're going to put response, which lines up with this parameter here. We're going to put the template location. So in this case, main slash, and we'll do base.html for this one. Okay. And then we'll do a comma and we're going to put a open dictionary. Okay. Now I'll talk about this dictionary more later, but for now it's, uh, we're just going to leave it blank. Now we're going to copy this return. I'm going to do the same thing in home, except instead of base, I'm going to do home.html. And that's actually going to be all we need to do to show these te uh, HTML templates that I've created. It's pretty straightforward to do this. So now obviously I'm going to have to run my site. So let's, uh, I got to activate my virtual environment one second here and we'll just do Python manage.py run server. Uh, okay, so I didn't make any mistakes. It doesn't seem like so let's load up Google here and let's hit enter. And now you can see that we've directed to the home page and we get base template. Okay, now, so let's see how this worked. So when we went in URLs, we didn't type any number. So we were past just that empty string. So what we did is we navigated to the home page. So the home page is right here. This is the function. And what it does is it renders this home.html file. So now we go to home.html and in here we can see that we're extending the base.html file, which means we're going to use everything from that. So what we do is we go to base.html and we say, okay, this is what base.html looks like. Let's use that. And then it uses that and we get base.html. So now let's try uh, using, for example, one. Now before when we used one, what happened was we saw the to-do list and the item. Now we're not going to see that because we haven't programmed that into our HTML, but just notice what happens when I type slash one. Uh, query does not exist. Okay, of course it doesn't exist. Anyways, just pretend like that popped up. I'm now I'm frustrated why that didn't work because we the to do list there's no to do list that has ID one apparently. Um, hmm, that's interesting. Let's try two or something and see if that works or zero because this should really be giving us something two. There we go. Okay, two. So apparently <laughs> the object we have in there has ID two. So anyways, now that we have some object, we have ID two. You can see that again, it's showing this base template because we're rendering the base.html template from our index view. And when we went to URLs, we typed some number. So we went to index and we passed in the ID as that number that we typed into the address bar. Perfect. That is literally how templates work in terms of rendering them. Now it's time to show how we can make some dynamic templates that I'll actually change based on what you're typing. So obviously right now, um, so this one's rendering our base.html. This one's rendering home.html. In previously, we had passed through some value, which was our to-do list name, and we displayed that on the screen. So how can we do that now using templates? Well, inside of our templates, so this is base.html, what we can actually do is we can um, 
use some variables that are passed from views and we can display those in our HTML. So for example, rather than putting base template here, say I wanted the base template to show uh, all of our, what do you call it? Sorry, our different to do lists, then what we can actually do in here is we can put two so we can of these so open and close uh, curly braces to them. And inside here, we can type a variable name. And then we will pass that variable in from our views. So for example, if I want the to do list name, maybe I'll pass that in as the variable name. So I'm going to put name here now. And what this means is we're going to be using a variable called name. Now what I need to do is I go inside views.py and I say, okay, so we're using a variable name, we need to give that variable to our view. To do that, we use these right here, this dictionary. So we are going to type the corresponding name, so name here, to what we've typed in our HTML. And then we're going to do a colon and put the value that we want to pass. Whoa, what just happened with my lights? One second, guys. Sorry, something just happened. Okay, anyways, um, now what we're going to do is we're going to do ls.name. So we're going to say the variable name inside of our base.html corresponds to ls name. Now, because we've done that there, we're going to run into an issue in our home one because we're looking for some variable name inside our base HTML, but inside our home HTML file, we're extending the base, which means we need to pass that variable as well. So for right now, I, this obviously is not ideal. We're going to change this in a second. I'm just going to put name and then in this case, I'll just say test just so that we actually get something that's working. But let's try this out now and see uh, if everything is the same. So if I run this now, you can see that instead of showing me nothing or showing me base template, it's showing me first list, which is the name of our first list. And if I go to the home page, you can see that we just get test because that's what we've passed in as a variable. So that's really the easy way to pass variables is through this dictionary here. And it's nice because you don't actually have to type the dictionary here. Like you can make like my underscore dict equals, and then you can update it with a for loop, or you can pass a ton of different stuff into this dictionary and then just put, for example, my underscore dict here, and it'll work the exact same way. Okay. So now we've done that. We've kind of understood how this works. Now let's go back in templates and talk about some more advanced stuff that we can do. So for example, Ideally, we've kind of messed this up a little bit because inside of our base HTML, we're displaying, um, what do you call it? The name of our to-do list. We probably don't want to do that because on our home page, we probably want to say something else, right? Or we just, our base page probably shouldn't do that. So what I'm actually going to do inside here is I'm going to set up what's known as a content block, which can be over, uh, overrode from other, uh, templates and you'll see how this works in a second. So if I just do my 2% signs here, I'm going to type the word block and then give it a name. So in this case, I, well, I won't do name. I'll do block content. And then what I'm going to do under here is I'm going to do two signs like this and I'm going to say block uh, or sorry, end block. Okay. Now just for good practice, I will put this inside of a div. So I'm just going to say div and I'll say ID equals in this case, uh, content and then name equals content just in case I want to reference this later. We'll do that and we'll just end the div here. So tab that in. And now what I'm able to do actually is from inside my other templates that extend this template, I can pick what's going to go inside of this block. So for example, the web title is always going to be the same, but if I want to put something specific inside here, depending on what web page you're on, I can do that from my other templates. So on home, for example, I probably want to say like homepage or something like that. So to do this, I'm going to do a very similar to thing to what I've done here. I'm literally just going to type the same thing and say block content. Okay. And then I'm going to close the block like this by saying end block. And inside here, I'm going to put a pair or actually I'll put an H1 tag and I'll just simply say, uh, what do you call it? Home page like this. Okay. So now I'm just going to go in views and I'm going to remove this, these uh, variables from here because we don't need them anymore. And let's run this now and see what we're getting. So on the home page, if I hit enter, you can see now we're getting home page. So what we've done is we've said, okay, so this is our base template. The content for each of the pages that inherit this is going to go inside of this block content. 
So if I go here and I type block content, I can put whatever I want here and it's just going to paste it inside of here for me. Now this works the same uh, with other kind of blocks. You can create more than one block and you can choose whether you want to use them or not. So for example, if I want the title to be different, what I can do is inside of here, and there's no really limit on how you use the blocks. You can use them however you want. I can say block title. And then here I can end this block again. And you always have to end your blocks. You can't just leave them open. Otherwise you're going to run into some issues. Do end block. And then I can set a default title in here if I wanted to, for example, uh, Tim's site like that. And then here I can make this block again. So if I, I'll just copy this actually and paste it up here and name this title. And then here I can just name it whatever I want. So in this case, I'll just say home. Okay. So now what's going to happen is this block title is going to be again, overridden by this. And it's going to put that as the title of our web page. Let's try this out. And you can see that now up here at the top, it's changed to home as opposed to Tim's site. Now, if I go to like slash two, uh, you can see there's nothing here just because I haven't set any base stuff to show up inside of my uh, base content. If I wanted something default to show up, what I would do is just type like hello or something in here and then that would show up. But that's how the blocks work. And that's the first step to kind of template inheritance. Now I'm going to show you how we can actually write code inside of our templates to do things more dynamically. So this base.html file is fine. This home file is fine. But I actually don't want to be using this base.html file inside of my uh, as one of my views. I just want to inherit from it and then customize it from each individual view. So what I'm going to do is create another view uh, or another template, my bad, sorry. And I'm going to call this file, new file. And we will call this one, um, I guess, should we call it view? I want to view the to-do list. So maybe we'll just call it like list like that. Okay, list.html. And what this is going to do is display our to-do list for us. So the name of the to-do list and then each item on the to-do list, it's going to display that in a list form. That's what I want to do. So I have to start by extending from my uh, base.html. So really simple again, extends in quotes. I don't think it matters if it's single or double quotes. And then we'll say main or base.html like that. We'll set up our blocks. So our first block is going to be uh, the title block. So my percent signs. So block title. And then here we'll go uh, end block like that. Then inside here, what should our title be? Maybe we'll just say like view view list or something. We could change that later if we want. And then we'll set up our content block, which will be actually displaying the list for us. So block content. And then inside here, we will obviously end the block. And then inside of the content, what I'm going to do now is start working with some variables that we pass in from views. So actually, the only thing we really need, I guess, is we can say uh, ls is um, ls. And then from there, we can determine if we want the name here, if we want the items, we can do all that kind of stuff. So let's start by just doing an h1 tag, which is the name of the list. So to do this, I'm going to do h1. And then in here, we'll, we'll put remember our two curly brace sets. And we're going to say ls dot name, okay, because we're passing that ls object. So we can call any methods on it that we want inside here. So we have the name now, but we also want all of the items. And here's where things get a bit um, tricky, kind of tricky, but actually just really cool in how they work. So we could technically have infinite items. We don't know how many items we're going to have. So we need to loop through all of the items and then display them in kind of a list form. So to do this, we're now going to start actually writing some code, some Python code, Python ish code inside of our HTML file. So I'm going to write a for loop. And I'm going to show you how to do this for loop inside of your uh, templates. You're going to start by literally just typing the for. So you could say for, and in this case, I'm going to say item in ls dot and then item underscore set dot all. Now, some of you might think you need brackets here. For some reason, when you put the brackets, you run into an issue. So if you're going to be looping through something, don't put the brackets like that. Just leave it um, like this and it should work. So if you're running into an issue that says something like it can't uh, decipher these brackets, just get rid of them and that should work for you. That's an issue that I was running into. We need to also end this for loop. So I'm just going to type end for here 
And now inside of here, I'm going to show you what we do to display a ton of different items um, using a loop. So essentially, I mean, maybe just we'll indent this to be a bit nicer. Inside this for loop, I want every time this for loops runs to get the name of my item and display it on the screen. So to do that, I'm going to set up uh, a list. So I think what I do is I do UL. I haven't done HTML for a while, so this could be a little bit rusty. Do UL, which stands for our list. Okay. And then inside here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say LI like this. We'll end that LI tag. And then in here, we're going to use a variable, but our variable this time is going to be item dot text. Okay. Because we're going to get the item, which is that item object in our database from the item set of our list. And then we'll display that as a list item. Now, I don't even know if I have any um, items in my list. So we might have to add those in a second, uh, but that's fine. We can deal with that when we get to it. So now that we've saved this, uh, let's make sure that we're actually going to return list.html from our views. So instead of returning base, let's change this to list. And then let's run our site here quickly. Okay, so we get first list and we don't we're not running into any issues. But I'm pretty sure the reason we're not seeing all of the different items is because we don't have any. So if I want to add some let's end this and let's add some items to that list. So I guess to do this now I got to refresh my memory is we're gonna do a Python manage.py shell. And then I need to import from my database. So from import main dot models or I guess from main dot models from main dot models will import to do list like that and then what we're going to do is we're going to say I guess we'll say ls equals to do list dot objects dot get id equals two We'll print ls out. We see we get first list. So let's look at the item set quickly. So item underscore set dot all. We don't have any. So let's add some in there. So item set dot create. And in this case, I guess what do we just need? We need a text for that, right? So we'll say text equals. And then in this case, we'll say first item. And I guess we'll do complete equals false. Okay, so we added that. Let's actually add another item and we'll call this one second item and while we're at it let's do a third one okay so now that we've done that we can get out of this by just typing quit and then run the server again and then see if we've updated our list let's cross the fingers there we go and now all of our list items are showing up so first item second item third item and that's how you use a for loop inside of your templates and that's really like look how cool that is we don't have to we don't have to type a ton of HTML. We just do a for loop like we would in Python. We're very familiar with, and then we can just type whatever we want inside of the for loop in terms of HTML. And that'll show up on the screen for us. That's how that works. And that's really cool. Now we can also do if statements and else statements and stuff like that. So I will now show if statements. Um, it's going to be, this is a hard example. Actually, what I can do is say, we'll do another block in here. And in this case, what we'll do is we will only show the item if it's not if it's complete, right? Or if it's not complete, because if we're going to have it complete, we probably shouldn't show it. So first of all, I don't know why this is trailing here and get rid of that. And in here, I'm now I'm just going to do my percent signs again. And I'll say if and in this case, item dot uh, complete equals equals false. And then I will simply end if here. So I do percent percent and if like that. So we always have to end our statements. I know it's annoying, but if you think about it, we're not really working with indentation in these files. So it's not going to be able to tell what's in which statement unless we do an end if or we less our we end our statements. So we need to do that. Okay, so we've done that. And now I will actually just go back into the shell again. I know it seemed pretty counterproductive and make an item that is actually complete. Otherwise, we're not going to see that. So I guess we're going to have to import this again. So from main dot models uh, import <laughs> to do list. We'll say ls equals to do list dot objects dot gets id equals two okay ls dot item underscore set dot create and in this case we'll say text 
equals not showing and then complete equals true. Okay, so true like that. Hit enter, not showing, quit that and rerun the server. Probably should have done this before guys, but you know, that's fine. So if I run this now, you can see that we're not seeing that item that I just created. But if I change this to be true, okay, and save this now, and hopefully this updates quickly, now you can see that we're only seeing the item that is complete. So these if statements work just the way they work in Python. We, uh, you can see only the complete items, only the not complete items. And yeah, that's really how you do that. We can also do um, like an else and an else if and stuff. So if I want to do an else statement in here, I can just type else and then put whatever I want underneath the else. And we don't need to type end else because ending the if will tell us that we're done the entire kind of chain statement. So what we'll do actually, and this is kind of interesting as well, is inside of here, we'll do the item.txt if it's complete, but we'll do an all capitals complete after it, just so we know that it's finished. Otherwise we will say incomplete like that. So let's try running this now and see if I made any mistakes or not. Okay, so there we go. So we can see first item incomplete, second item incomplete, third item incomplete, not showing, complete. Awesome. So that is essentially the basics of templates, how we do the kind of inheritance for them. You can obviously have a template inheriting a template that inherits another template. And in future videos, we're going to be making these look a lot nicer. I just want to give you guys the basics here and make sure everything is working. In fact, let me make sure the homepage works. I forget if I showed that. Okay, it does. So anyways, that has been it for this video. If you guys enjoyed, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. And if you need any help or anything, feel free to leave a comment down below. I'm always answering those and I love to chat with you guys. So in today's video, what we're going to be doing is talking a bit about forms. Now, forms are essential to any website. An example of a form is something like a login form or a create new account form or maybe a create new to-do list for our example here. So what we're going to be doing today is just making a form that will allow us to create a new to-do list. And then in the next video, we will create a more advanced form that will allow us to add items to our existing to-do list. So I want to make a way essentially right now that we can create a new to-do list without having to use the command prompt. I just want to create a web page that'll allow us to do that. So what I'm going to do is create a new page on our website called create that will allow us when we go there to create a new page using a form. So what I'm going to do is start by setting up a path to that page, creating a new template, and then we will work on the actual form itself. So in this case, I'm just going to say that create will be where we want to go. Um, and then we'll say views dot create and we'll name it create like that. I think I can just I can probably just put create like that too, but whatever, that's fine. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's go into our views file. Let's create a new function. We'll say define create. We'll say response like that. And then in here, we're just going to return the same thing, uh, but we'll just change the file name to be create.html and we'll create that file right now. So we go inside of our main file here. I'm just going through this quickly because we've already essentially done this um, a bunch of times. I'm going to extend. So this extends and in this case, main slash base.html. And then we will have to do those blocks or we don't have to, but we will do those blocks. So in this case, uh, block title, and we'll just call this create new list. And then we will end the block like that. And I'm just going to copy this and put it down here, but just change the name of the block to be, um, what do you call it? Content like that. Okay. So now I'll save this as what do we want? Create.html. And we have created the template for our, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> create page. So in here, I'll just say create page and we will add the form content into here afterwards. So now that we've done that, we should have a page on our website. Uh, essentially that when we go to create, it'll bring us to this HTML page, which extends obviously our base.html. Uh, and to give you a reminder, this is what our base.html file looks like. Okay. So what we need to do now is actually create a form that will show up on our create page. Now, when you create forms, most of you are probably used to doing something like this, where you go in the HTML and you actually code the form yourself. So for example, you do form, you're going to say method equals, maybe we're going to say post in this case, and I'll talk about the different methods in a second. 
you're gonna say um, action equals and in this case we're gonna go back to the same page and then maybe you make a button and that button is type equals submit maybe it has a name uh, equals like save or something and then you end the button and maybe you do something like that so th like this is an example I'm just doing this because we're actually gonna need to do this um, but you guys get the idea that this is typically how you create a form and then above all of this you're gonna do all of the different fields in your form so for example you've got a username and password you do an input field for username input field for password you give them some labels some names all that kind of fun stuff now Django makes this a lot easier because all we actually have to do is pass in a variable called form and Django will actually generate the HTML for the form that we create for us now this makes no sense right now because we haven't created a form yet but what we're gonna be doing is passing a form object so we'll create our own form class and we'll create an instance of that and pass it into our uh, HTML and it'll generate the HTML for those form fields for us so for example if we had username and password this is all like whatever form we pass in here will automatically be generated for us and you guys will see how that works in a second the only thing that we need to do when we're creating a form is make these form tags like this and then add a submit button that will um, will submit the form for us that's all we have to do so now we actually need to create the form so this will start making sense now what we're gonna do is make a new file inside of our main application directory and we're gonna call it forms.py so let's save this as forms.py make sure we're in the right directory and what we're going to do uh, at the top here, we're going to say from Django import forms. And now we're going to create a class. And this class is going to be called whatever we want our form to be called. And it will define the attributes and the fields in our form. So I'm going to call mine create new list. And in here, we're going to inherit from forms.form which will allow us essentially to have the form automatically generated for us and to do a lot of cool stuff which we'll talk about later so i'm going to set now the fields for my form now these fields are the exact same as the fields in your database so for example like boolean field integer field anything like that um but what will so the way we do it essentially is we say forms dot in this case i want a character field for my name so i'll say character field or char field and then in here, I need to give it an optional argument, or I don't need to then, but I can give it an optional argument of label, which will be what shows up before the little box so that it, um, you know, we know what we're typing in here. And then we can give it a uh, max underscore length as well, which I believe is required. And I'm just going to set this equal to 200 characters because that's probably all we need. So essentially, all we're doing when we create a form is we're just going to list all of the different attributes that we want for our form as class variables underneath the, the class. So if I wanted another attribute uh, that maybe was like a check button or something like that, what I can do is I could say like check equals forms dot boolean field like this, and that's all I have to do. And now when I pass this form into Django, it'll automatically create not only a name, uh, what do you call it? A name character fields so like text input it'll also create a boolean field which will be like a check button and then we could do other kinds of fields as well and if you want to know all the different types i'll leave a link here in the description to all of these different kind of fields that you can use okay so that's how we create a form if you wanted to create another form same thing you would make another class and do all of the different attributes you want in that form uh, and we'll get a bit more advanced with it actually in the next video as well so anyways, now we've created a form. So let's go back to this views.py file and let's now actually pass this form into our create.html. So we're obviously gonna need a variable called form here and we're gonna have to pass that in. So what I need to do now is essentially, I need to create an instance of this form and pass it to my HTML. So to do that, I have to start by importing that. So, oh, I already imported it here. <laughs> but anyways, just do from dot forms import and then the name of your form. So in my case, create new list. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say form equals create new list like this. Now what this will do is create a blank form and we will pass that into our HTML and it will know what to do with it and generate the form for us on that create page. So let me show you this working in action now. So I'm just going to run my server. I'm sure you guys know how to do this by now. And if I go to this link, 
uh, here actually, and I go to slash create, you can see that now we get to create new page. You can see that we have a name, we have a check button, and we have this create new button. So that button was the button that I created, um, but this name field we didn't make, this check button we didn't make, Django automatically generated that for us. Now, notice that obviously these don't look great. We wanna add some HTML to them, we wanna add some CSS, we wanna do all kinds of stuff. I'm gonna show you how we can do that later, but just know that Django is capable of automatically generating all of the HTML for your forms. So. So before we go any further into how we're actually going to get information from this form, because right now we have, we're not actually doing that and it's not going to work if we actually try to submit this form, I will show you how we can look at the form in a different way. So for example, if we go to create.html here, there's a few default layouts for our form. So we have as underscore table, which is what is actually showing for us right now. But we also have dot um, as underscore P, which will mean that the form will go like vertically down so all of the items will keep going down and then we have as underscore ul which means the form is going to show up on little dots like as a list item so these are a few different ways that we can show the form um just looking like a little bit different so if i do as p for example i believe we're running the server right now uh and i go here and refresh you can see that now it looks a little bit nicer in terms that we have the name and then we have the checkbox and they're just right after each other in new paragraphs now I just want to show you that if I try to hit this button, notice that we get this little please fill out this field, nice looking um, JavaScript actually pops up. Now, the reason this does this is because Django is generating the form and the HTML for us. If we had created our own form, we wouldn't have we wouldn't see this this nice pop up text, right? Um, so that's one of the advantages of using the Django built in forms. Although I will show you kind of the limit some of the limitations you may have with that. Now, if I go, to, if I hit this um, checkbox, same thing, you can see even when I'm hovering over it, we get like, please check this box if you want to proceed, like stuff like that, right? Now, notice that if I type something in here and I hit create new, it says, please check this box. Well, this box might be an optional checkbox. If we want to make this not a required field, then what we can simply do to do that is go into our forms and inside Boolean field here, we can say required equals false. And now if I refresh um, the website here, it, you see when I hovered, it's not saying anything. And if I type like something in here and hit, sub, hit create new, it will work. Now I'll show you what happens right now when I do this and how we can fix this. So when I do this, it says we get a CSRF verification failed. Now that is because whenever we're creating a form inside of our HTML, we need to actually add uh, th these tags and I'm about to show you. So essentially we need to just do CRSF underscore token every time that we create a new form inside of Django. This just needs to go inside of our form tags. Don't ask me why, because I honestly don't really know. It's something to do with security in terms of like verification and validation and stuff. So just put that in here whenever you create a form. So when you try to submit it, uh, you don't run into any issues. Okay, so now that we've done that, it's time to actually start creating new to-do lists based on what the user types in. So now it's time to talk about the difference between post and get requests. So if I'm going to go to, I'll go to views.py for right now, and we need to talk about post and get. So there's two different ways to send information to the server, and that's essentially what our form is doing. When we hit submit, submit, what's going to happen is it's going to save all of that information that was in our form. It's going to bundle it up in some kind of way and send it to the server. Now, there's two main ways of doing this: post and get. Now, the reason there's two, like the reason they have two different ways is because there's two different functions for each of them. Typically, like technically, you can do anything with get that you can do with post, but they have different security reasons behind them. So, for post is you're going to want to use post essentially whenever you're doing something that's kind of secret. So for example, getting a user's password, if you're sending that to the server, it needs to be encrypted because otherwise if it's not, then other people can very easily see the password and change it and do all kinds of stuff. So you're going to use post whenever you're essentially doing anything that's kind of secret or the information needs to be encrypted when it's sended, sent to the server. Now you also use post whenever you're making any modifications to like the database or anything like that. You use get 
when you're just trying to s simply like retrieve information. So for example, say I type in um, like the ID of the, what do you call it? The to-do list I wanna get. Well, we could get that using a get request, not a post request because we don't, like everyone can see what the ID of the to-do list is. That's fine, we don't care about that information. What actually happens when you use get is all of the information that you type in the form gets pasted in the URL. So when it goes to the next page, it just simply reads the URL and gets that information. Whereas post actually hides the information, encrypts it and sends it to the server. Now I'm oversimplifying exactly how these work, but I wanna make sure you guys understand the difference between post and get. If you're unsure, just use post. But the reason you would use get over post is for example, say you wanna um, bookmark like a search result or something, um, or you wanna save some information, which is a specific URL, then you would use get because, I don't know, like I'm trying to think of a good example. If you ever go, you ever go to any links, like let's go to YouTube, for example, and then <laughs> youtube.com slash, and in this case I say like search equals tech with Tim. You ever see something that looks like this? This is what's known as a get request, where the information that the user typed in, in this case it would have been in the search bar for YouTube, um, gets pasted in the URL, and then if you hit this, I don't think this is gonna work because this is obviously not the way you search for something on YouTube, um, but it just gives you that page, right? Whereas if I'm gonna be typing in my password, it's not gonna save the password up in this bar because it's gonna use a post request. And obviously, the reason we'd use this get request is because maybe we want to save these search results and bookmark them and we wouldn't be able to do that if we're using a post request so anyways that is how post and get works i'm sure you guys are already confused <laughs> if you have any questions let me know but i'm trying to explain it as best as i can so anyways when we use this um what do you call it this create window or this create page we are going to use a post request because we want to encrypt the name of the what do you call it, the to-do list that you are creating. And because we're gonna be modifying the database, we need to use a post request. So anyways, all we have to do, we don't have to touch anything in here because we've already set that the method is gonna be post. But what happens when we have post and get requests is they are actually passed through this variable to our view. So our view knows or can tell based on this variable here, whether or not we are trying to post something or we're trying to get something when we access this page. So to check this, if we've passed a post request or a get request, what we do is we say if response um, dot method equals equals, and in this case, post. And this will tell us if we are trying to make changes, we're passing information from the form back to this page. So if we are posting, we're gonna be doing something different than if we are getting. So those are the two requests, right? Post or get. By default, it's always get, um, but whenever you're changing something, you're gonna use post. So anyways, we're using post now. So if we're using post, what we need to do is the following. We have to say form equals create new list, but in here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say response dot post. Now what this does and what this is holding is all of the information from our, uh, what do you call it, from our form. So essentially when we get this response.post, it's gonna contain a dictionary that has all of the IDs of all of our different attributes, all of our different inputs, and it's gonna save the values that you typed in them. So when you pass this to create new list, what it's gonna do is create a new form that has those values populated in them. So by default, right, if we go to forms, you can see that we don't have any default value for the character field or for the Boolean field. So what's going to happen is it's going to automatically set those values to what is received here. And then we can start doing things with this form and validating it and creating a new to-do to list. So now that we've created this form, what we'll do is we'll say, um, what do you call it here? We're going to say, if form dot is underscore valid, what we'll do in here is now we will create a new to-do list and add that with the name that was given to us. So we're gonna say T equals, and then to-do list, and we'll say name equals, in this case, we'll say N up here, say N equals at form dot cleaned underscore data name. Now I'll talk about what this is doing. So essentially our form is going to um, take this post and it's gonna get all the data from the form and then we're able to access that data by just using it like a dictionary. So you do dot cleaned underscore data, 
I'm just going to clean up the data for you, unencrypt it. And then what you do is you type the name of whatever the field that you want. So in this case, we named ours name. So we use name and then we can get that data and we can use it to create a new to do list and then save that to do list like that. And that is all we need to do now so that when we use this form, every time we type in a name that's valid, it creates a new um, to do list. Now, this might be a little bit confusing, but I hope you guys kind of understand it. This is valid method is automatically created and exists because of the fact that we're inheriting from forms.form. And this thing is amazing. And what it does is just automatically checks all of the fields that you've defined to make sure that they have valid input. If they do, then this is valid will return true. If they don't, it will return false. And obviously you were seeing that it was telling us what was wrong with uh, all of the different fields when it was incorrect. So let's go back to create now. Let's click, uh, I might have to rerun the server here. We'll see uh, if save this, save all this stuff. And I think that updated. Uh, anyways, we'll check here quickly. So I go back to create. You can see now that we have create page, we have name and we have a checkbox. So let's now do like create a new to do list called Tim. Let's say create new. And what will happen now is essentially we have created a new to do list called Tim. Now you might not actually be able, you can't tell that we've done that. Um, but that is precisely what we've done. Now we can create more to do lists. I can say like, uh, new to do list, Tim, we could say like Joe create that. Uh, and that has created a new to do list for us. So now let's actually show that to do list right after we create it. So for right now, all we're doing is just returning the form with whatever information we passed in it. But what we can do is we can say that, all right, if we're saying response is post instead of returning that form that has the name of the to-do list we just created, let's redirect to that to-do list so you can see what it looks like. So to do that, what we can say is we can say return HTTP and instead of saying response this time, we will say HTTP and then response redirect. Uh, if I can get my capitals working here, <laughs> redirect like that. And then in here, all we have to do is put the page we want to go to. So in this case, I'm going to say slash and then I like a percent I, and I'm going to say uh, percent. And in this case, I'm going to say T dot ID, which will be the ID of the to do list we want to go to. Now I also just have to import this HTTP response. Um, so I'll do it up here. So from Django .http, import HTTP response redirect. And now what will happen is instead of returning this form and returning the main dot create HTML page, we will redirect to the page that we've defined here, which will be the ID of the to do list we just created. So now this should have updated. It did. So let's try this again with Joe. We say create new and we are redirected to the page that displays Joe to us, right? Uh, and that is essentially how that works. So that is the way that you create a form. If we wanted to, um, let's say, get more information from the form, what we could do is print out um, like if the checkbox was hit or not, like we can do all kinds of stuff. You can obviously create more than one form by doing multiple forms in here. You can have more than one form on each page with different submit buttons, all that kind of stuff. In the next video, I'll talk about creating custom forms. So modifying some stuff, maybe making some things look better. And then in future videos, we're going to be adding bootstrap to our website and we're we'll doing login forms, all this kind of stuff. So if you guys don't get it now, we will be going over more of it in the future, but these are just kind of the basics of Django forms. So in today's video, we're going to be going a bit more advanced with forms, we'll be showing you how to create your own custom forms that are a bit more dynamic than typical Django forms that we were using in the last video, using that forms class and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, I guess let's get into it. So the goal today kind of is to allow the user to add an item from their to do list. So right now we don't actually have any way for them to add items. We only have ways for them to add new to do lists. So we're going to do that. We're also going to add some check buttons beside the to do list items so we can show whether or not they are complete or incomplete without having to do this incomplete complete kind of thing. So right off the bat, I'm actually just going to delete this incomplete and complete for now. And I'm going to start setting up a form inside of my HTML file here. Now, the reason we need a form 
is because we need to pass the information, like whether the user clicked a check button or whether they, uh, what item, for example, they typed in to add to the list. We need to pass that back to our view using a post request. So we need a form to do that. So I'm going to start by creating a form. I'm going to say method equals, and in this case, post, and I'm going to say action, uh, what do you call it? Equals pound like this, okay? Or number sign, whatever you wanna call it. Now I will simply close my form by doing that. And now I'm going to start by just setting up some buttons at the bottom of my form that say save and that say add item. So what I'm gonna have is I'm gonna have two buttons, save, add item. Save is gonna save the changes to your checks and add item is gonna add the item that we will get from a text field that I'm also gonna add. So the first uh, button that I will create will be that save button. So to do that, I'm just gonna say button, I uh, will say type equals, and in this case, Wait, do we need type for a button? Yeah, we do. We'll say type equals submit. We'll say name equals, and in this case, it'll just be save. And I'll say value equals, and I can say save here as well. Now, when I close my button, I'll put whatever I want to display on it here. So in this case, I'm going to say save. And I'll copy this actually, and I'm going to just use the same thing, except instead of name, I'm going to say new item. I don't know why that tabbed there. And we'll give that value of new item as well. And obviously now I'm just gonna make this add item. I mean, I could make it new item too, it doesn't really matter. And in between here, I'm going to add an input field, which is my text uh, that you're gonna type in for when you create a new button. So I'm gonna say input, we'll say type equals text, and we'll say name equals, uh, I guess we could say item, why not? Uh, item is probably not the best name actually. Let's just say new. All right, new is probably not a good name either, but whatever, that's fine. Okay, so type equals text, name equals new, and sweet. Now, what I'm gonna do now is add those check buttons in beside all of our items. So obviously, if our item is complete, we want that check button to start off as checked, and if it's not, we want it to not be checked. So to do this, it's similar to the text. We're just gonna say input, we're gonna say type equals, and in this case, check box. We'll say value equals, clicked and you can call this whatever you want but just remember this name because we're going to need to use this and we're going to say name is equal to and this is a little bit weird but we're going to set the name equal to the id of our item so to do this what i'm going to do is just go in here and say item dot id and before that i'm going to put a c so that what we're gonna do now is we're gonna say all of our check buttons because this is going to create a bunch of different check buttons right they're going to be given the name c and then whatever the ID of that button is. This will just make it way easier for us to determine which check button was checked and what item that corresponds to. And you'll see how we do that later. So let's copy this now. And I'm going to put it uh, right here as well. So inside these li tags. Now the only difference is up here where it says is complete if item.complete equals true, I'm just gonna type checked like this, which will default it to start off checked. That's all that's gonna do for us. Okay, so now we've actually uh, set up this form. The last thing to add is our CSRF token that we always need to add whenever we create a token or a form, sorry. So CSRF underscore token like that, and then hit save. So now that we've done that, our HTML will be showing up all nice. And now we just need to handle this from our view. So remember our view is called index. So what I wanna do in here now, very similar to create, is I wanna first off start by checking whether or not we have posted something or we're getting something. So if we're posting something, we're gonna say if, and then in this case, response dot post, or not post, sorry, dot method equals equals post like that. Then we will start doing all the stuff in terms of saving and adding items. Now I wanna quickly go back here and talk about something for a second. So right now we have two buttons. We have save and we have new item. And these buttons might have different functions and they do in this instance. So for example, save, well, we only want save to look at and update the check buttons, right? That's what it's gonna do. It's just gonna update your check buttons if you've completed an item or if you haven't completed it. Whereas our new item button or add item button is going to take the text from this text field and add it as a new item on our list. So we need a way to determine which button we clicked so we can determine what function we are going to perform. So to do this, what you can do actually is you can say if response dot post dot get and then here you can put the name of your button so in this case i'm gonna say we'll start off by doing save save like this okay now what this does actually is whenever you get a post request 
um, from the server, what's going to happen is all the information in this form here is going to be passed in what's known as a dictionary to our uh, view. So what's going to happen is we're going to get a dictionary that looks something like this. So we'll have save and it will either have no value or it will have a value of whatever we typed here as value. So for example, save. If we click this button, what's going to happen is it's going to be added to a dictionary, which is all of the information from this form, and it's going to be given this value only if we click it. So what's going to happen is we're going to get the name save points to the value save, and it's going to look like this precisely. Okay. We're also going to get all of the information for our check buttons. So what will happen is we'll get something like C1, which will be that ID, right? C1, and that'll point to in here, it'll say, and I'll print this out after you so you guys can have a look at it. It'll say clicked if we clicked the check button. If we didn't click the check button, we're just going to get a blank string or C1 might not even show up in the uh, the dictionary. OK, so and then we can also try what do you call it? For example, like add item, we can do the same thing with add item. Now, the thing is, if we clicked add item, then it will come in and it will give the value of add item. Uh, otherwise, it won't give us any value. Just give us a blank string and you guys will see how this works in a second. I'm going to print it out for you so you can have a look. So let's actually if we are posting, let's print uh, response dot post like that. So you guys can have a look. Okay, so anyways, so we're going to see if we are saving. So if we're saving, then this will uh, evaluate to true because there'll be some value. So that'll just work. Otherwise, we'll say uh, what do you call it? L if response dot post and dot get and in this case instead of saying save we're gonna say new i think was it new item i keep forgetting what i call this yes new item awesome new item okay so we'll just pass down here for now and let's work inside of this first one up here so what we want to do up here is we want to look at all the different check buttons and determine whether or not they were clicked or not and then update our item accordingly so to do this what i'm going to do is i'm going to loop through all of the items in our current to-do list because we still have this value up here and we're going to check the IDs of that with the check buttons and see if it was clicked or not. So to do this, I'm going to say for, uh, I guess we'll say item in, and in this case, ls dot item underscore set dot all with lowercase l's. Okay, then what we will do is we'll say if, and in this case, response dot post dot get. And in here, what we're going to do is we're going to say C plus str and then item.id. Now what this is doing is getting the item ID, converting it to a string and adding a C to the beginning of it. So we will get the exact same kind of pattern of what do you call it names or IDs as we're setting up here, right? Cause we have C in that item ID. That's just what we're doing here. So if we get that and that is equal to the value of clicked, then what we need to do is, well, we need to update that item. So we'll say item.complete is equal to, and in this case, true. Now, otherwise, so if we didn't get that or it wasn't equal to clicked, we'll take this, but we're going to set it equal to false. So this is the same as like if you unclick the check button and it doesn't, um, it's not checkmarked, then this will run right here what I'm doing now. And then all we can simply do down here is just say, I guess actually inside the for loop, we'll say item dot save. And there we are. Sweet. So that's how that works. And that's actually it for this uh, saving the check buttons. Now what's left to do is to add a new item. This is uh, it's similar in terms of how we do this. But what we're going to start by doing is getting the text that was in that text input field here. So the name was new. So, so say text is equal to and in this case response dot post dot get and here we'll say new. And now what I'm going to do is before I add this new item, because this will give us the text, I want to validate that this is valid input. Now you can do whatever checks you want on this input and usually Django will do it for you. But since we're not using Django forms, using our own custom form, we don't have that option of using is valid like we used here. So what I'm going to do is just say if text, I guess we'll actually say len of text is greater than two. So it's at least three characters. Then I will simply add that item to the to-do list. So to do that, I'm going to say ls dot item underscore set dot create and in this case we'll say text equals and I'm actually gonna have to rename this to txt here I uh, will say txt and then we will say complete equals false like so 
Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to print out a message that just says like invalid input just so that we can have a look at this in the console. And that should actually be about it. Now, I'd be surprised if I didn't make any mistakes, but let's give this a run. I already have the server. Or actually, I'm going to have to run the server again here. Run the server. So let's now attempt to go to like ID2. So now we can see we have first item, second item, third item not showing. Now, if I decide to check an item or uncheck an item and hit save, uh, mm, what is your issue here? Name response. Oh, well, it would help if I spelt response correctly. Where did I misspell that? Re, of course, in the print statement. Anyways, <laughs> let's see if this will update now. Uh, Python managed up high run server. Did I make another mistake? Let's see two. Okay, now let's try it. Save. There we go. So then you can see that the item saves. Now, if I go to maybe let's say page three, and I want to add an item, let's try hello, and we click add item. And now you can see that we get hello popping up and I can check I can save that I can unsave it. And if I go back to two, you can see that obviously the same checking pattern is still there, I could add a new item. So we'll just say new item here add that and you can see that it's popping up and I can save that. So that is how you make a custom form. This is very useful. And what I've just shown you will allow you to do pretty well anything with forms because now you know how to get information from forms. Now I will show you actually what our post requests are looking like just so you can see or sorry, uh, what is it requests like what I'm printing here, I'll show you what that looks like and talk a little bit about that before we wrap up here. So you can see that uh, if I go here, we have check button C2, and that is given a value of clicked. We can see C5 is given a value of clicked, and C7 is given a value of clicked. So those IDs for our check buttons. We see that save is given the value of save because we hit that save button. But we see that we're not seeing any other um, values here, right? So if we don't click an item or if we're not um, giving a value to it, we're not going to see it here. So for example, like if we have C2 and we don't check that button, it's just simply not going to show up in the information that it passed to us, which means that we can check if it's not there and then do something accordingly. So the way that this get request works uh, when we say get like this or this get method is since this is it's like this is kind of a dictionary, but this get method is specific to this type of data structure. And essentially, if the item doesn't exist, I believe it just returns none, which means that if we ever put something like this, so for example, if save isn't there, we simply won't run the block because if none, obviously it's not going to run. So that's the way that that kind of works. Um, you can see, I mean, I would highly encourage you guys to kind of mess with this and do some requests, print them out and see what it looks like. That's really the best way to understand how this works. Um, you can see it's a type query dictionary. And when you try to get something, if it doesn't exist, it just says none. If it does exist, it'll give you the value that corresponds with it. And in some instances, you can actually have multiple values pointing to the same name. So that's just something to keep in mind that you guys might notice when you go through this. So anyways, that is essentially how that works. We've created a custom form. Now we know how to add things. And with this information, uh, we can go into creating some more complex stuff. So in the next video, I think I'm going to be adding bootstrap onto the website, making things look a little bit nicer, maybe adding a sidebar. We'll do some stuff like that. And then later on, we're going to get into user registration and all that kind of stuff so that you can actually have all of your to do lists stored under a certain user. So anyways, that has been it for this video. If you guys enjoyed, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe and I'll see you in another video. So in today's video, it's going to be a little bit shorter. And what we're going to be doing is simply adding a sidebar to our website and making things look just a little bit nicer. Now, in the next video, we're going to go on to add bootstrap to our website and then be able to make something that looks pretty well like this. Uh, and I'll show you guys some more of this example in a second. But for right now, we're just going to be adding this nice sidebar with some hovers and kind of showing you how to go about doing that. So anyways, let me give you a quick preview on what our website is going to look like in the next two, maybe three tutorials. So for example, we have these links on the side here, we can view all of our different to do lists. So if I go to new list, you can see that we go there, we can go to create, which will allow us to create a new to do list. And then obviously, if we go inside of a to do list, we can see all these nice check buttons, we can hit save, we can add a new item, for example, by doing that. And this is just kind of the basics. I haven't gone crazy with this, I could obviously make this look a lot better be a lot more dynamic. Uh, but this only took me about 15 20 minutes just to style and make everything look decent. So anyways, that is kind of what we're gonna be working towards in terms of using bootstrap, which is just some CSS that's pretty much already made for us and uh, adding a sidebar today. 
Okay, so let's uh, get out of this and let's go into our, uh, what do you call it, file here. And all we're going to be doing to add this sidebar is working inside of this base.html file. Now, because all of these files inherit from base.html, this makes it really easy to add stuff like a sidebar to our website because all we have to do is add it into the base template and will automatically be added to all of the other ones. Now, what I'm going to start by doing is just setting up a div here that's going to represent our sidebar. And if you're not familiar with HTML and CSS and all this stuff, I'll try to explain how some of this stuff works, um, but it is pretty straightforward. You should get it pretty quickly. So I'm just going to say the class is equal to, and in this case, side nav uh, like that. And then we will end that div. And inside here, I'm just going to put a few links, which will be our sidebar items. So in this case, I'm going to say slash home, and this link name will be home like that and copy these a few times okay so home will have create and then we can add one more link if we want to uh but we don't actually have anywhere for this to really go to yet let's just do like slash two and just call this uh view okay so anyways, what I'm doing right now, guys, uh, in case some of you are confused, essentially, is this href just stands for where this link is going to go when we click on it. A stands for a link tag. And this div is just a way that we can style a bunch of different elements at once by doing, for example, class equals side nav. And now what we're going to do is up here in our head tags is we're going to create a CSS kind of script or style sheet within our HTML file here and define what our side nav is going to look like. Now we also need to add a class here to our main div because I'm going to add some stuff in here and this class will just be called, what was it, main, like that, okay? So anyways, what I'm going to do now is go up top here and I'm just going to add a bit of styling stuff to make this div here that we've added of links appear on the side of the screen a certain color and then add some hover effects and stuff to it as well. So this is really just going to be adding some CSS at this point. So I'm just going to add some style tags here. Uh, we'll close that style there. And in here, I'm going to do type equals, and in this case, text slash CSS like that. And now I'm actually just going to copy off my other monitor because I can't remember all of the styling I've done on this. Uh, but essentially, if we want to access or change the side nav class, what we do is we use a period representing a class. And then we type the name of our class, which is side nav, we can add these uh, brackets like this. And then inside here is all of the styling we want to apply to our side nav. So for example, we want the height to be equal to 100 pixels, which are sorry, not 100 pixels, 100%, which means that it's going to take up the entire height of the screen. So you saw that on my left side, it took up the entire height, we're going to say width, and in this case, we'll just give it a pixel value. So 160 pixels, and you can modify this value if you want. We're going to say position. Uh, and in this case, it's going to be fixed. We could make this a dynamic sidebar, but I'm not going to do that in this part. We're going to say Z index. And in this case, one, which means that it's going to stay all the way at the top of our screen. Uh, we're going to add top, which is zero. We're going to say left uh, zero like that, which just means again, stay in the top left hand corner of our screen. We're going to say background. And in this case, is it even there? Uh, it's not background, I believe color. And we're going to say this is pound one, 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 which will give us that kind of dark blackish gray color you guys saw before. We'll say overflow X uh, and this is hidden. And I don't even remember what this one does. Oh, it does say it makes sure that we don't go horizontal uh, with our sidebar. And then we'll do padding from the top uh, of 20 pixels. Now, just to as a disclaimer here, I did not create the sidebar. I just found this on some like CSS website and modified some of the attributes. So that's what I'm going off of here. If you guys want to create a different kind of sidebar, you can feel free to modify these kind of properties, change the color. Like they're pretty straightforward on how they work. Or you can just look up like nice sidebar or nice title bar online and they'll probably give you the CSS uh, and even the HTML on how to do that. So now I'm going to set up what my links inside of my sidebar are going to look like. So whenever you want to specify a certain tag from within a class, you do the class name and then the actual tag itself. So in this case, side nav a, which means if I highlight this, you can see it's actually highlighting all of these a tags here that are inside of my side nav. So what I'm going to do here is say padding. Uh, and in this case, we're going to say six pixels, uh, no, eight pixels, six pixels and 16 pixels. And again, feel free to mess with these numbers. We're going to say text and in this case, decoration, and this will just be none for now. 
and then down here we're going to say font and you guys can mess with this as well you have to look up the fonts if you want to know what these mean is 818181 and display in this case is going to be block style so is that all uh oh sorry what am i saying this is color and the font i must have misread this here the font is going to be just we're going to do the font size which is 25 pixels like that okay so that's it for the side nav a tag and now all that's left to add is actually what happens when we hover over our aid um, tags so for example if we hover on these we want to change the color so we can do that from within css so to do that what we're going to do is literally just copy this except we'll add this uh what do you call it property here called hover and then all we're going to do is just simply change the color when we hover so to do this we'll just change this color to uh, f1 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 and yeah there we go okay so we've done that now and the only thing left to do actually is move this uh, what do you call it this main content here over to the right because right now what we are actually going to have is we're going to have the sidebar and then this content will go below the sidebar we don't want that so to move this content block or i guess this class main over uh, it's pretty straightforward we'll do dot main like that and then in here we'll just say margin hyphen left and in this case is 160 pixels did i spell margin correctly no i did not and we'll just add a bit of padding here so we'll say padding and then in this case we'll do zero pixels and 10 pixels like that now that should be about it actually for our sidebar and by applying this to our uh, base.html file this will apply to our entire website so let me actually get back into my uh what do you call it file here so i can run this for you guys so cd django tutorial cd my site and in this case we'll just do python manage.py run server and let's grab this link here go to google chrome and let's see how this looks okay so there we go so we've created a nice home page here you can see we have home create view uh, if i go to home ah uh, so slash home doesn't exist that's just my bad i don't have a slash home page here um and I, if i go to create you can see we have this nice little create now and if i go to view it brings me to uh list item number two or whatever it is or to do list number two so that is precisely how we add a sidebar and you can see that this is a really nice thing that we have essentially is the fact that we have this base.html file because look i just applied this sidebar to my entire website really easily so now i actually i feel like i must have forgotten some kind of font size here because on my other website the font looks better but um you know what for now that's just fine so anyways uh, I, that is actually gonna be it for this tutorial I know this was a bit shorter um, but this shows you how to add a sidebar it also kind of shows you how you can style some of your different items if you want to add some more content blocks or you want to add classes to specific things you can do exactly what I've just done here inside of your other files as well you can add some style tags or you can add the style tags here and then add the classes on stuff like this and yeah so in the next video we're going to be adding bootstrap to our website which is a, a nice css styling and we'll make it look a little bit nicer change some of the fonts um, and just make everything look a bit cleaner so anyways that has been it for this video if you guys enjoyed please make sure you leave a like and subscribe and i will see you again in a now so in today's video what we're going to be doing is just adding bootstrap to our website and doing a little bit of styling i'm going to show you guys how we can add some just nice looking classes and how you can kind of look through the bootstrap documentation to find what you're looking for so all we'll do is really just style a few different elements and make things look a bit nicer and then i'm kind of going to leave the rest to you guys so with that being said let's get started so I'm going to head over to the Bootstrap website and it actually gives you a really easy and quick way to get Bootstrap on your website. And all we're going to do to do this is just kind of follow this page. So first, let's talk a little bit about what Bootstrap is. So Bootstrap essentially is a uh, CSS, JavaScript, jQuery framework, which allows for you to add some custom built styling to your website. Now this uh, actual framework is built on what's known as a mobile first site framework or like, so it's meant for building responsive mobile websites that, and then they will expand to desktop applications. So apparently that is kind of the best way to do it now is to build stuff ideally for mobile because that is where most of the web traffic is nowadays. I believe I could be incorrect. Um, so you build it first for mobile and then you kind of expand it out into desktop. So anyways, 
uh, let's get started and use Bootstrap. So what we're going to do is just follow this page. So the first thing we need to do is copy this uh, link here. So CSS, and I'll leave the link to this page in the description if you want to do this as well. So I'm going to copy this uh, style sheet here. And all this, uh, all this is essentially is this kind of style sheet, but just online that we're going to access and be able to use. So it's served on what's known as a content delivery network, which means we don't actually have to download the style sheet. We can just copy this link in here at the bottom of our head tags, but just above the title. And we will start using this, uh, this style sheet on our website. Now that we've done that, there's a few other things we need to add. So let me go down here to the starter template and just copy a few things we're missing. The first thing I'm going to add is just these meta tags and these meta tags apparently are important. They just set up some properties for your website. So we'll put them below this link like that just to finding the uh, type of characters you're going to be using. And then I believe this is something to do with the mobile friendly kind of look or whatnot. So now that we've added that, uh, they might have to go above that. We'll add those above. We'll add this doc type HTML. So just exclamation point doc type HTML. We'll add that at the top of our file like that. Hit save. And I'm just going to move these meta tags to go above our link here. So our style sheet like that. Sweet. So now that we've added that, there's only one more thing, or I guess three more things actually that we need to add. And those would be these scripts. And these scripts are used by some of these CSS classes and to do a little bit of animation and just make things look a bit nicer, maybe move some components around the page. So we're going to add these at the bottom of our body tag. So underneath all of the content here. Now you don't necessarily need to add these scripts, but in some cases when you use certain CSS classes, they will require these and then things might look a little bit funky or things might be off. So anyways, now that we've added that, we're actually ready to start using Bootstrap. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of add some divs and some different classes into my main content block here. And I'll talk briefly about what they do, but really the way to understand this stuff is just to go to the bootstrap documentation. So for example, if I go here and just look at all the different components and kind of copy the stuff that you like that what it looks like and then customize it. So for example, if you wanted a large button, you would go to the buttons tab here for components. This link will be in the description as well. Uh, look at a button you like and then literally just copy the tag or the class for it and then you can customize it accordingly. So that's what I'm going to be doing for this kind of, and I'm just going to be copying some code that I've already written to style my website in a way that I think looks, I mean, decent. Okay. I haven't gone too far. I didn't take too long to do this. So anyways, let's add some divs here. So the first div I'm going to add is class equals in this case row and then justify and in this case, content, content and uh, center like that, which just is going to mean that we're going to put this in the middle of our web page. Uh, so yeah, so we'll add that. And now what we'll do is we will add another div and this div, we're going to say class equals. And in this case, column eight, which is going to define what column space we're going to be in. We will end this div here and we'll add a few other things as well. So now I'm going to add an H one tag and this H one tag is actually going to be the header of my website. So inside of this tag, you're going to call it whatever your header you want. So I'm just going to say minus my site and I'm going to give this a class of in this case, we will say uh, MT hyphen two. Again, I'm just taking these from the bootstrap website. If you don't know what this stuff means, you can either just look up the class and it'll show you the styling for it, or you can just go to the bootstrap website and look for ones that you like. So in this case, I'm going to do MT zero MB hyphen four. And what this is going to do is draw a little line for us underneath our header just make things look a little bit nicer. So that's all I'm actually going to add here for this main base template. Now let's go to our website and let's see how it looks. So this is what it looked like before. And just with those few adjustments, when I refresh the page, let's see how it looks now. Okay. So there we go. Um, so actually, so these little check buttons here shouldn't be here. One second guys, just because I might not have saved a page because I was messing around with it before. Let me refresh this now. Uh, there we go. So that's uh, now what we're getting. Now it should be in the middle of the page, which is kind of throwing me off just a little bit. Uh, I spelt justify incorrectly. That would be why. So row justify content center. I knew I was doing something wrong there. So now let's refresh this. And there we go. Now we can see that it's moved to the middle of the page. And we have this line here, obviously, as well still. Sweet. So that's um, it for just styling the base template. So now that's going to apply to all of the web pages that we have. If I go to create, for example, you can see that it applies to this as well. 
So now it is time to style some of the other pages that we have. So the first one I'm gonna style is this create page. So notice this is what it looks like now. Let's mess around with this now. What I'm gonna do is change some aspects of this form. So I'm gonna add a class here and I'm gonna say this class is form hyphen group. I'm just gonna put this create page into, uh, let's say like an H3 tag for right now, uh, just because I want it to be a little bit bigger on the page. I won't add any, uh, any styling to that. So now we'll add some divs inside of this. So the first div that I'm gonna have is just gonna be an input group. So I'm gonna say div, and in this case, class equals input hyphen group, in this case, mb hyphen three. And then I will end this uh, like this, I believe. I, this might be the correct place for it. I'm probably gonna have to mess around with these a little bit, but we'll see. I'm also just going to put this form instead of doing form dot as P I'm just going to get the name attribute from our form. So the way I do that is just by saying form dot name. So rather than showing the entire form, cause we have that little check button, I'm just going to show the name text box. Cause that's all I actually want for right now. So now what I'm going to do is actually, I'm going to move this uh, underneath here. My apologies. And I'm going to add another div and this one is going to be class equals. And in this case, input hyphen group hyphen prepend now this is a really nice um div that they have here a class that they've made and what this does is well you guys will see in a second is it makes this button kind of mesh with this text input so they go they look at like in one line where it has the button and then it has the text input field right beside it but they're like combined together and it looks really nice you guys will see in a second how that looks now the last thing i'm going to do is just add a class to my actual button itself so i'm going to say class equals in this case btn and then btn hyphen uh what was it uh success i believe yes btn hyphen success and that might actually be it for all of my styling for this page so let's go ahead and have a look now and see how this looks if i run this there we go, we get create page, and now you can see what this prepend did. It took this button and it put it on the left side of my text input. And notice that we get this little these little things coming up. This happens obviously because of uh, some of the JavaScript and stuff. We have please fill out this field. You can see that's there. If we go to create new, uh, we can see that pops up with there's a hover for it. Like just all this nice stuff that Bootstrap does for us. Some of it's done by Django, but most of it's done by Bootstrap. Now I'm going to go to view. So now it's time to make this one look a little bit nicer. So let's go ahead and do that. And then we'll wrap up the video here. So uh, this will be a little bit more tedious, but let's actually get rid of this kind of UL view and tags and stuff. Cause I don't think we're going to need to use these. Uh, yeah. So let's get rid of these ULs and let's get rid of these LIs because right last time we we're just using LIs to make them show up in a nice kind of group, but we'll use some, uh, some, classes here from bootstrap to do that for us so we can uh tab this back so let me do that actually i probably should have just left it because i'm gonna have to put this inside a div but anyways inside of our for loop now i'm gonna create a div i'm gonna say this class is equal to and in this case input hyphen group and then we'll do mb hyphen three and then i'm gonna add a prepend in here as well because i want to combine these check boxes with um what do you call it the text which we'll add in a cool way in a second so i'm going to delete these texts right now and what i'm going to do is add a prepend here so i'm going to say div and in this case class equals and in this case what was it it was something like prepend input group hyphen prepend input group hyphen prepend let's tab these in we will end this div and we will end the other div as well just to make sure we don't forget like that so now what i'm going to do is outside of this this div but inside of the other one i'm going to add that text that i have back in so i need to actually get the item text i'm going to add this though in a weird way i'm going to add this in an input box so the way i'm going to do this i'm going to say input and in this case we'll say type equals text and then we'll simply just say value equals and in this case we will say, uh, what was it? Item dot text like that. Now we'll add a class to this as well. We'll say class here equals, and in this case, form hyphen control. And there we go. Now that's it for the kind of displaying the items. So let's actually have a sneak peek of how this looks and see if I made any mistakes or not. 
Um, okay, so it's not ideally what we want it to look like, but you can see we have these text box and then we have the check button. So let me make sure I didn't make any critical errors here before. I might have either misspelled something or forgot to add something. Ah, so I've forgotten one class, which was probably pretty important here. <laughs> so we're gonna add another div. And in this case, we'll say div class. And in this case equals input hyphen group hyphen text. We'll end that div. Where is this div ending? I believe right here. And that should be good for that. I don't wanna say for sure, but let's see. There we go. So that's better. This is what I wanted. Now you can see we have the check buttons kind of showing up on a nice little color here. And then all of our items show up in text boxes. And I mean, you can actually edit the items. Uh, but when you save them, it's not gonna, it'll just go back to whatever you had. But I just wanted to do them in this way because it looks really nice. And now what's left to do is just modify these buttons here. So let's go ahead and do that. So what I'll start by doing is adding a class or a div here. So I say div class equals and in this case, We'll say input hyphen group, in this case, MB hyphen three. I will tab all of these, I guess, except for, let's see which ones I actually want. I'm gonna put the save button, I think, on a different side. So let me put the save button down here and I'll tab these two in these add item. And I'm actually gonna do the same thing that I did with the creating a new to-do list in terms of that pre-pen thing with these items. So to do that, I'm gonna add another div in here. And in this case, I'll say div and then class equals, in this case, input group hyphen prepend. You guys can tell I like this, this prepend thing that you can do here. Uh, prepend, we will tab these in, and then we will close these divs. So slash div and slash div, but I believe that I have to put this input actually right here. Uh, and that I think is correct. There we go, sweet. So now all I need to do is add some classes to the button. So I'll add the same classes that I used on the other one. So I'll just say class equals, in this case, btn, btn hyphen success. And I'll just copy this and we'll use this class down here as well, just to be consistent. So anyways, that should be it for styling. Let's have a look now if I refresh, uh, continue. There we go. So now we get add item and we get save and things are just looking a lot nicer on our website. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done, but take in, I did this in 13 minutes in a video or however long this video is and I've been kind of explaining things as I go but I'll quickly show you that if you want to look at the different components and see all of this different kind of stuff just go to the bootstrap documentation this is the link I'll put in the description go to components here and for example if you want to look at a nav bar and how this works then it'll explain to you how to create one and you can just really copy kind of however whatever you want from here if I go to for example buttons you can see all the different kind of buttons and how to make them. And it just tells you what classes to use. You use those classes and then it looks nice on your web page. So anyways, that has been it for this tutorial. If you guys enjoyed, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. And I will see you again in the next one. So in today's video, what we're going to be doing is talking about user registration and how to create an account on Django. Now, fortunately for us, Django actually does quite a bit of the hard work, at least for us. So all we have to do really is format a form and then just add a few things to our project. It is a bit of a tedious process, but it's much easier because of Django. And another reason why a lot of people love Django, because it does stuff like this for you. Now you can see right now I have open uh, the thing we're going to be creating. Now, this is just in a copy of the project that I'm working on. And I just made this to make sure it was going to work, uh, create account page. And we're going to be making this to start. We'll be adding an email field to this as well, or like a ad name or something like that field to this as well. And yeah, that's kind of all we're going to be doing today. In the next video, we'll talk about how to log in and how to log out and then how to restrict access to certain parts of the website to certain users. So for example, the admin user can access the admin dashboard and they can see all of the different databases and all that, whereas a regular user won't be able to do that. So let's get started. Now the first step uh, and what we're gonna have to do to do this actually is create a new application. So what I wanna do is right now we already have an application called main, but I wanna create an application now called like users or called register or something like that that is going to handle the login, logout, and registration for our website. Now this is, the reason I'm doing this is also so that you can just copy this application and put it into any other Django project. 
and because it just kind of makes sense to separate things out. So to do that, we're going to go to our command line and we're going to create a new app using that Python manage.py file. So we're going to say Python manage.py and we're going to say start app. And in this case, I'll just call mine register like this. You can name yours whatever you want, but I'm just going to say register. Um, so there we go. It has successfully executed. And now if we go to our directory, we can see that we have register popping up here. Now, what I'm going to do to start is I'm just going to, uh, what do you call it, modify some URLs. So we're going to add a page that we'll be able to use to register because we need a register page. So let's open up subline text here. Um, let me just open up a new window. Why is this not working? Uh, one second, guys. File, uh, open folder. Here we are. Okay. So Django right there. Okay. So there we go. Now we're in Django. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the URLs from within my main file here so that we're going to link to a view that we're going to create inside of our new application called register. So if I go to URLs here, you can see that right now, these are our main URLs that we have inside of our main application. But what I want to do is go to the URLs inside of my site. So let's do that here. And what I want to do is just add a new path that's going to direct to a new page. And in this case, I'm just going to call this one slash uh, create, I guess, or actually not create. Let's do uh, register. So like registering for a new account, we'll call it that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, link this directly to the function that's going to render this from our register uh, application. So what I'm going to do inside of register now, and I'll come back to this in a second is inside of views.py, I'm simply going to create a function. In this case, I'm just going to say define, uh, we'll call it register as well. It'll take response. And then in here, all we'll do is just return render, and then we will render something in here in a second, but we'll just fill that in for right now. So we go back to URLs. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to import this file. Uh, in this function so that we can use it from in here to link directly to that uh, view. So to do that, I'm going to say from, and in this case, we'll do register because that's the name of our folder, uh, register import in this case, views as, and I'm just going to say V. Now, the reason I'm saying views as V is because we could possibly be importing some more views into here and all of them are going to be called views, right? Like the views for this application is the same as the name of the views for the main application. So just by doing it as something, uh, that way we're going to differentiate them so we don't run into any mistakes essentially. So now I'm going to say uh, what, what we'll go to is we'll go to V dot in this case, um, actually from register import views, we'll go to V dot register like that. And we'll say name equals in this case, register. Now add that comma. And we should be good in terms of linking to that. Okay, so now that we've done that, what I want to do, first of all, is create an actual page that will be our register page, which involves creating a template for that. So I need to do the same process I did to create templates within my uh, main application. And that is starting off by creating a new folder inside of our register application. And in this case, I'm just going to call it templates, uh, templates like that. And then inside of templates, I'm going to create another new folder. And if we remember, we call this register. Now inside of register, I can create my file, which will be my register.html file, uh, which will display the form that we're going to see. So I'm just going to start by extending my base template. And the way that we do this now, because this is in um, what do you call it? A different directory is the exact same as before. We just have to specify where we're getting it from. So we're going to say main slash base.html. And then what we're going to do in here is we'll do our blocks. So we'll have the block title and we'll have the uh, block content. So block title. And in this case, we'll just say uh, create an account or something like that. And then we can end that block and block. And then now we'll do our block content. And then we will keep going from there. So say block content. And then here we'll say percent percent and block. Now we'll save this as register.html inside that template file. And there we go, we have now created the file that we can render and display on the screen. Now while we're in here, I'm just going to fill this in and populate it and uh, all I'm going to do essentially to do this is 
I'll use a little bit of style, a little bit of bootstrap styling, and then just display the form inside of here using the way that we can just display Django forms. And then you guys will see how it works in a second anyways. So let's start by creating some form tags. We'll say form, in this case, we're gonna say method equals post because this is gonna be the form to create a new account. So obviously it's gonna to have to be a post method because we need to make sure that information is secure when we're sending it to the back end. Say form method equals post. I'm gonna say class is equal to, in this case, form hyphen group. And then we'll end that form tag. And in here, we will simply do, um, what do you call it? Form like this. Now, the only other thing we need to add is a button. And this button will be the submit button because by default, Django doesn't generate that for us. So what we can do to do this is just say button. Uh, we can say type equals, uh, if I didn't hit insert there, we can do type equals submit, submit like that. And what else do we even need for this? We say class equals, and in this case, btn, and then btn hyphen success. I believe that's the class name. And then we can end that button tag. And inside here, we'll just say, um, what do you call it? Join or like register like that. And that's what we're going to do for now. We'll make this look a little bit better after, but that's all we really need for right now. Okay, so now that we've done that, we've said, well, we're gonna pass a form to this view. So that means from inside here, we're gonna have to be passing a form. Now, what's really nice is Django actually automates the form uh, for, what do you call it, logging in and creating a new account. It makes one for you that you can just use. So what I'm gonna do is simply import the built-in Django form, and then we're just gonna use it inside of here to pass to our register template. So the way that we do this is we have to, um, I'm actually just going to copy these in because they're a bit long and I don't want to mess up the uh, the spelling. We're going to say from Django.contrib.auth, import login, import authenticate, and then we're also going to import uh, from Django.contrib.auth.forms, we're going to import user creation form. Now this user creation form is what we're going to use to uh, create a new user. And it's an, a pre-built form, just like when we went into our application and we created our own form using the Django built-in forms. This one's just already made for us and we can go ahead and start using it right away. So to use this, I'm going to say form equals, and in this case, user creation form. And then when I render my template, I'll pass a response. Uh, we'll do in this case, register, and in this case, slash register.html. And for the context here, we'll pass in form colon form. So assuming I spelt everything correctly, now if we actually run our server and go to this, we should see a form showing up. Uh, actually, one step for that, that I should not have forgotten, but I almost did. We need to add our application in this case, which is register into our settings.py file. Because if you remember when we initially created a new application, you can see that we added this main.apps.mainconfig. Well, we need to repeat this process now with our new application, which is register. So let's just copy this and paste it down here. And instead of having main, we're gonna change this to just be register and here register as well. Remember that capital at the beginning. Okay, so now that we've done that, assuming I didn't make any mistakes, if we run the server, we should be all good and we should be able to see all this stuff. So let's do this now. We'll say python uh, manage.py, and in this case, run server. Okay, no issues. So let's grab that. Let's go. Actually, I'm just going to refresh this and it should pop up. And now you can see that we are actually getting this beautiful register window. Now I'm saying that sarcastically because obviously this does not look amazing. And we're gonna work on styling this and making it look a little bit better in a second, but you can see that we actually have a somewhat functional user registration window already created for us. And you can see it says required 150 characters. Uh, this is the thing that you need for passwords. And then it asks you for username, password and all this stuff. And then there's a register button that we created. So that's awesome and that works well. Now all we, the thing is though, if we actually type anything in here, so for example, I say Tim and make my password one, two, it says, oh, your password cannot be entirely new numeric. It must be at least eight characters. Okay, let's just type, um, let's type a bunch of letters, for example. And if I type a bunch of other letters and hit register, um, we run into an error that CRSF CSRF token is missing. So we'll have to add that. But my point here was gonna be that this register button doesn't actually do anything. Just like when we created a form before, we actually need to add the functionality to save the form and create the new user, which is what we will do now after we add that uh, token that we need. So let's add that token first of all, inside of here, um, CS, 
csrf underscore token. And now let's go into views.py and let's check how we can validate this form and how we can actually save things using it. First of all, before we start styling it too much. So what we're going to do is what we've done before. So we're going to say if response dot method equals equals, and in this case post, then that means that we are going to be creating a new user. So what we'll do in here is we'll start by saying, actually, we'll take this form. Uh, we'll put it up here. And inside of here, we will populate this with response dot post. Now it will say, say if form dot is, and I believe it's underscore valid, what we can do to save the form, which is very easy, is literally just say form dot save. And what this is going to do is actually save our new user in the user's database for us. And I'll show you how this works in just a second. Um, but let's add this else here so that we create a blank form if uh, for some reason, we're not getting that post request, right? So this is all we need to do actually to handle and make this form work. Obviously, we're going to be doing a lot more here be uh, before we're finished, but this will actually allow us to have a valid form. So let us um, try to get this working now. So let me go back here and let me refresh the page. And now let's try to create an account and let's say, let's make an account tech with Tim. Uh, we can just make the password tech with Tim one, two, three. Okay, and let's hit register. All right, um, what was the issue? The password, the two password fields did not match. Okay, so you can see actually as well, maybe that was good that I messed this up. Uh, it even gives you messages when things are wrong with the form. So it says the two password fields didn't match. So that obviously means I spelled something wrong. So let's try that again. And hit register. The password is too similar to the username. Oh man, see, this is <laughs> this is why we use Django Forms because they do all this wonderful stuff for us. Okay, let's try this now. Tim with tech, how about that? Uh, Tim with tech, one, two, three. Tim with tech, one, two, three. Register. The password is too similar to the username. Okay, I'm just gonna use one of my own passwords and hopefully it doesn't show it anywhere on the screen. Okay, so now we've registered and I actually create an account um, called tech with Tim and I've I've done that. I know it doesn't look like anything happened But that's what we're gonna add as well next when we create an account we will redirect to a new page But let's try going to the admin dashboard here quickly and see if we can see this new user in our database So let me sign in here and if I go to users You can see that now we actually have two users We have Tim which is the admin user which is me and we have tech with Tim Which is the new user that was just created so if I go into tech with Tim, um, that's like the password hashing and stuff. And then you can see that it has the name and that's all that we have for right now. So the next things that I want to add to this now is how we can get like an email or how we can get a first name and a last name, for example, and how to redirect to a new page once we've uh, created an account. So once we've created an account, what I'd like to do is redirect to a new page. So to do that, what I'm going to do is from Django.shortcuts, import render, import redirect. And all we'll do in here is just instead of returning uh, this response, we'll simply just return a redirect. So we'll return redirect. And in this case, where will we go? We will just go to slash home. So now if I create a new user, we would go to the home page uh, and the user would be created. So that's great for that. But what I want to do now is have the ability to add a new uh, field to our form. So for right now, all we had was those three fields. But what if when you create a new user, you want to ask a ton of different questions like a phone number, you want to get all that kind of stuff. How can we do that? Well, to do that, what we need to do is inside of our application here, uh, I believe we need to create a new file called forms.py. So what we're going to do is inside of register, we're going to do new file, we're going to save this as forms.py. And we're just going to modify our form slightly. So save that as is there an issue this reason why this isn't working forms.py um, hit enter okay I'm very confused right now why this is not working forms okay uh, anyways let's try this one more time okay so for some reason that was just messing up but anyways forms.py and what we're gonna do for this now is actually uh, import the same things that we had before so this login authenticate user creation form so let's copy those and paste those in here and what I'm gonna do now is just create a class that is that inherits from user creation form and add a few new fields to it so to do that I'm gonna say class and in this case I'll just do uh, register form 
and we'll inherit from user creation form. And that means we're going to get all of the same properties as user creation form. So we're going to have that nice layout as well. But instead, now we'll add a few new attributes. So for example, if I wanted to add an email here, what I could do is I could say email equals and in this case, uh, models, uh, which I need to import as well. So let me import this. So we're going to say from Django dot models, I believe import model, it's either models or models. Any Anyways, so let's do that email equals models dot and in this case, we'll say email field like that. And this might be lowercase. I'm not sure. Okay, so we'll do email field there. And now what we're going to do is add something that we haven't done before, which will allow us to change some of the parent properties of this class. So I'm going to create a new class inside of this class, which is called meta. Now it needs to be named this. And what I'm going to do in here is define the fact that this register form is going to save into the user's database. So you know how when we did a uh, user creation form dot save, it saved the form. Well, we need to say that when we're using this form, we need to save in the user database. So to do that, I need to import a few other things. Uh, so one second here, what I'm going to do is just go to, I'm going to say from Django uh, dot contrib dot auth dot models. And in this case, import user. And actually, I need to change this Django dot models thing up here because this is incorrect. Uh, I'm going to say from Django import forms and instead of models, this is going to be forms my bad on that. So we'll say Im email equals forms dot email field. And then inside of this meta class, what I'm going to do is say model is equal to in this case user. So I'm defining that we are going to change the user model whenever we save something in this uh, this form. So now I'm also going to define one more property, which is going to be fields. Now what this fields property is going to do is um, pretty much lay out where I want my fields to be. So typically when you uh, sign up, you ask to do a username and email a password and the other password. Well, right now, if I were to actually use this form, this email field wouldn't be showing up. And that's because inside of the parent class, it doesn't know that we have this email field. So I have to define that. So to do this, what I do is I simply type the name of the fields inside of this list in the order that I want them to appear in my form. So if I wanted email to show up first, I would type email. If I wanted a username to type up first, I would type username. So in this case, let's do username, email, and then we'll do password one and password two. Now these three field names, username, password one, and password two are already built into the form. So this user creation form, that's why I'm using them. If we were to per se, create another field here, maybe we create a field that was like your gender or something like that. Then we would have to put that field in here as well if we wanted to show up on the form and this will specify in what order we want things to show up. So that's how you can change that as well. So now that we've done that, we need to now start using this register form rather than using this user creation form. So if I go in my views.py file now, I can actually remove this what I'm going to say is from, and in this case, we can just import it directly from forms. So we'll say from forms import. And in this case, we'll do, uh, I guess it was register, register form like that. And now rather than using user creation form, we'll use register form like this. And this should be working for us, assuming I did not make any mistakes. So register form. So now let's try to reload the page and see what we're getting on. Um, what do you call it? Let me make sure that this actually is running quickly. Is it seeing that we changed anything? Uh, one second, guys. Uh, no module named forms. Interesting. I have forms.py right here. Let's try from dot forms and see if this works. There we go. So I just need to add that dot before form before forms. Okay, so let's go now back to uh, what was it register like this and see what we get now. Okay, so now we have username, email, password and password confirmation. Now I know this is still very messy, but we have successfully added an email field. So now it's time to actually make this look a little bit nicer using a little bit of bootstrap and what's known as crispy forms. So crispy forms is a really popular um, form kind of framework used in Django and you just have to install it using pip. So what I'm going to do is simply go into my command line here and do pip install and we're going to say Django hyphen crispy 
hyphen forms like that. Uh, so not equal sign, that needs to be a hyphen. And what this does is it has some automatic styling for our forms. It's really easy to use. So that's what this module is essentially. So we're just going to pip install that same way that we installed Django and just make sure that it's in your virtual environment. Now you can see I already have it installed, but once you have it installed, there's a few steps we have to actually use this. So to use crispy forms, what we need to do first of all is go into our my site uh, settings file. So we need to find my site, my site and go to settings.py and we have to add crispy forms into this settings.py file. So to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to say crispy. Uh, I think it's just crispy underscore forms. We, I'm pretty sure that's all we have to do, but I will double check here because I'm likely incorrect. Um, let's see here. No, nope, that's actually correct. So crispy underscore forms. And what we also have to do is go down to the bottom of our settings.py file and we have to define what um, CSS layout or I don't know, framework that our crispy forms is actually going to use. So to do this, I'm going to say crispy and in this case, underscore template uh, underscore pack. And in this case, I'm going to say bootstrap four. Now, if you want your crispy forms to use a different kind of framework, uh, CSS framework, you can just look up how to do that online. It's very simple, but you just change this. The reason I'm setting this to Bootstrap 4 is because by default, it uses Bootstrap 2. And on our website, we're already using Bootstrap 4, so we might as well just use it now. Okay, so now that we've done that, we actually have to start using these crispy forms. That's what they're called. So since we've have them uh, imported into the project and we have everything set up, all we have to do to use our crispy forms is at the beginning of our, uh, what do you call it, file here. It actually doesn't have to be at the beginning, but it just has to be before where we use it. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, use our crispy forms. So I believe to do this, we have to say include something. I have to have a look because I forget how to do it. Ah, it's not include, it's load. So load crispy. Uh, underscore forms like this and in this case underscore tags now all we're gonna do to use this crispy form very straightforward is we're just gonna put this little up uh, what is it straight line here bar I, I don't know what it's actually called if someone knows comment down below and beside it we're just gonna do crispy like that now what this does is it's actually a filter and I'm not really going to talk about exactly what filters are, but if you know fil what a filter is, then that's what this is doing. It's just going to modify our form to make it look a little bit nicer and add a bit of styling to it. So let's try this now and see if everything is actually working. So let me run the server, see if we get any issues or not. No, we don't. So now let's refresh this and let's see the drastic change that is about to happen. There we go. How much nicer does that look than our other form, right? We have username, email, password, and password confirmation. That is just much better. And you can see if I go register, it's still doing this. So that is essentially how we create a register form for our users to create new users. Now, right now, it'd probably be a good idea to add like a bar on the side to do register and all whatnot. Uh, but for now, we're just going to leave it at this. In the next video, what we'll do is talk about logging in using these users and all that kind of stuff. We might add a little bit more to this register page, but for now, I think that's fine. Uh, and with that being said, that's going to be the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe and I'll see you again in another one. So in today's video, what we'll be doing is talking about logging in and authenticating users. I will also show you how we can only restrict uh, pages so that users that are logged in can see them. So for example, we maybe don't want a user that's not logged in to be able to create a new to do list or because that probably won't work. Uh, so how we can do stuff like that. And then in the next video, what we're gonna, I'm going to be doing is talking about creating a custom user model, which means that we can add things like all of our to do lists to a specific user so that each user has their own to do list. And when they go on the website, they're going to see different to do lists, not just all the ones that have been created by any user. That's what we'll be doing in the next one, but this one will just be logging in, validating, and logging out as well. So what we actually need to do first of all when we're going to be logging in and logging out is we need to create those login and logout pages. Now luckily for us, Django actually does a lot of this work for us. They have a built-in application, and if I show you in settings.py here, 
that is django.contrib.auth. And what this does is it authenticates users. So we've done all the hard work of creating new users, but now since we've done that, Django can actually authenticate those for us. So we can use some of the built-in things in this application to do that for us. So the first step uh, in what we wanna do is we actually wanna use some built-in pages that Django's made. So they actually have made logout, login, um, what is it, change password, like a ton of different pages like that, that we can access uh, simply by linking to them in our URL patterns from our main URLs file inside of my site. So what I'm gonna do, just like I've done to get into my other applications, is I'm just gonna say path, and in this case include, but in here I'm gonna say uh, django.contrib.auth.urls. And I believe that's correct, but I will check that quickly to make sure I didn't mess that up. Uh, yes, so that's correct. So what this will do now is it'll go to this application. It'll look in the URLs file there and we'll see if we have a valid URL. So if we have login, logout, change password, create password, uh, a bunch of those different pages. Right now we're just gonna work with login and logout, but you know what I mean. So that's what that'll do for us. But the thing is these uh, views, if we try to go to them now, they actually don't exist. So what those templates attempt to do or what the views attempt to do is render a template called login.html, logout.html from a specific folder that we need to create. So what we actually need to do, and it doesn't really matter where we do this, but I'm gonna do it from inside of my register application. So inside of templates, I'm gonna create a new folder. And in here, I'm gonna call this registration like that. Um, now it's important that you spell registration correctly like I just misspelled it registration because it's going to look for this specific folder. So we're going to create a registration folder inside one of our templates folder and then in here we're going to create a new uh, HTML file and we're going to call this login.html. Now this is going to be where Django will look uh, and what template it will use to render our login form. So what we'll do is we'll simply just do what we've done before. So we'll start by extends, um, and then in this case, main slash base.html. And then we'll add our blocks for our title and for our content. So let's do that now. Uh, block title, and then we're gonna say end block, like that. And then I guess we can do the title, we'll just do login here or something like that. And then, you know, what? I can just copy this and we'll just change the name to content. And now we're just going to create a nice form in here that will display our form just like we've done probably four or five times by now. So we'll say form, we're going to say method equals in this case post. And then we're going to say class equals in this case form hyphen group. Now we can end our form like that. And then inside of here, we'll add our CSF our token or whatever that is csrf underscore token and we will simply display our form now i want to add this to be a crispy form so it looks a bit nicer so to do that we'll have to load in our crispy tags so we'll say load and in this case crispy underscore forms underscore tags I believe that's the correct way to do that. If you don't have crispy forms installed, go back and watch the last video because we did that there. And then what we'll do is we'll add a filter here and we'll say, as the filter, we'll just say crispy and this will display a nice form for us. Now we also need to add a button into our form because that doesn't come with it. So to do that, we'll say button, we'll say type equals in this case, submit. And then I guess we'll say class equals btn btn hyphen success and end our button and just say login as the name. Sweet, so that should be it for this login form. Now we actually may want to add one more thing because sometimes you go to a login page that says, well, rather than logging in, like create an account if you don't have one. So maybe we'll add that in here quickly, just make things look a bit nicer. So we'll just add, I guess, some p tags and I'll just say slash p and I'm going to say don't have an account question mark create one and then I'll add an a tag which will just link to our create so I believe it was slash register we did was it slash register or slash create that was that URL let's check inside of where is it here uh, register register is the name awesome so let's go back here register and we'll say here and then slash a Sweet, so that should actually be it for the login page. 
and now we can actually go ahead and run our server which I already have running and we will see that the login page is actually working so this is the logout page let's go to login and see what we get slash login um oh well if you spell extends incorrectly extends there you go <laughs> then it won't work now let's try it if I refresh this here there we go so now you can see that we actually have a nice login page and this took us all of what uh, six minutes to create so it's pretty straightforward and what will actually happen here is this will properly do our logins and validate users for us so let's try to log in this is a valid login right now password one two three four when i click login you can see that uh it's actually directing me back to the home page now the reason that this is happening is because uh i actually have something added down here in my settings.py file that i forgot to like resave uh, that was telling us to redirect that page but let me just refresh this let me go back to login and do this again because i want to show you what happens if you don't have that uh you can see that it brings us to this no page not found, which is probably what you guys were getting when you're running this. Now that's because what happens is when we try to log in, it's going to automatically attempt to redirect us to a page called accounts slash profile. Now we obviously haven't created a page or a URL for accounts slash profile. So what we need to do is we need to modify where we're going to go once we log in. Now the reason it was happening for me is because I had, I had done that previously and forgot to save removing it. But let's go inside our settings.py file inside of our my site and let's add a redirect to let's say the home page whenever we log in. So to do this, I'm going to say in this case, log in underscore redirect underscore URL equals. And in this case, you can pick wherever you'd like to go, but I'm just going to do slash uh, standing for obviously the home page. So let's do that. Now let's rerun and try to log in. And well, we will see that we should be directed directly to the home page. Once we log in, let's do that. And you can see we are brought to the home page. So that's awesome. Now I'm just going to quickly move this up uh, one because I don't like how that looks. Let's put this P tag just above here. And now I want to refresh this and that looks a little bit better to me. So sweet. That's how we log in. Now let me show you what's actually happening in the back end when or how we can validate if we're logged in or not, because right now there's not really any way for us to tell whether or not we're logged in or we're logged out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go actually all the way back into my main application into templates and base.html and I'm going to create a, th a thing that essentially only shows our main content uh, body. So like this block content, if we are logged in, otherwise it will tell us to log in and it'll leave a link that says login. So a way that you can actually tell if a user is logged in or not is by using what's known as user dot is authenticated. So I can actually create a code block here and I'm going to make this an if statement. I'm going to say if user dot is underscore authenticated authenticated. I think I spelled that correctly. So what this does is by default, whenever you go to a web page in Django, it has a user attribute, which stands for the current user. Now, if there's no user um, signed in, I believe it defaults to what's known as an anonymous user. So if you call user dot is authenticated on the user, if it is a valid user that's properly signed into the web page, then this will return true. If it does not return true, then the person is not signed in. So essentially, I only want to show this content block for all the different pages that I have if we're logged in. Otherwise, I want to ask the user to log in or even maybe redirect them to log in. So what I'll do here is now I'm going to put an else statement uh, that'll say essentially else. <laughs> so if you're not logged in, what we'll do is we'll literally just put an a tag and you, you guys could obviously make this look a lot nicer than I'm going to do. And we'll just link it to the login page and we'll say uh, log in here. And you can just click this whole thing and that'll, you know what, actually let's put this in a P tag, make it look a little bit nicer slash P. And instead of having the whole thing be a link, we'll just do login here. All right. So now we will hopefully redirect to the login page. And the last thing I need to do before I forget is just end this if block. So we'll say end if, and there we go. So let's now go back and let me go to home. And I don't think I'm currently logged in, but we'll see. And okay, so it is, I am currently logged in. So what I want to do actually is just log out. 
So logout brings us to this logout page, right? That just says, thank you for logging out. This is the default logout page. I'm going to show you. We can change that in just a second. So now let's go back to the web page and let's just go to the home page. And you can see that now that I'm not logged in, it says log in here. If I click this, um, oh, okay. So that is actually an issue. So what's happening essentially is when I go to the login page, since we're not logged in, it's not showing the login page because that's the block content. Uh, so <laughs> this is probably not the best way to do it, but this is how you can tell if someone is authenticated. So maybe actually let me remove this. Um, yeah, <laughs> because it won't let us log in if that is there. So let, we'll remove this for now and just leave it as block content. But that shows you guys how you can restrict kind of page access to people that are logged in. So obviously on certain pages, you might want to add that if statement so that it's showing different stuff based on if you're logged in or if you're not logged in. But that is essentially kind of how you do log in and log out. I'll really quickly show you how to change the logout page if you'd like to do that. So same thing as kind of changing the redirect here for login. So all we'll do is we'll just literally copy this and change this to log out uh, underscore redirect dot URL. And then here we can just define whatever page we want to go to when we log out. So if you had created a logout template, you could go to that. You could go to essentially whatever you want, but just by doing that, I'll just leave it as a home page for now. Uh, but you know, you get the idea. So I guess the last thing I'll show you is let's say that you are create some URLs inside of your new application. So maybe we go, we have a URL and we have to create. So let's go to the create page for a second. Uh, I actually want to go to views. My apologies. If we want to get the user from with within code, we don't want it just inside of the HTML file. What we can actually do is we can type response dot user. Now, when you do response.user, that will give you the user and you can run dot is authenticated. You can get all the attributes of the user, like the name, the password, the email, all that stuff directly from the code. And then obviously you could pass that into uh, the context of the page or you could do whatever you need to do with it from the back end. So I figured I'd show you how to do that quickly. So anyways, that has kind of been it for logging in and logging out pretty straightforward. In the next video, we'll create a custom user model and we'll talk about how we can modify that model to add attributes like all the to do list to a specific user. So anyways, that has been it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe and I will see you again in the next one. Now, I know I said I was going to be doing like custom user models here, but the thing is to do what I wanted to do. I actually don't need to use those and they're way like they're they kind of overcomplicated so i figured we'll just do it the pro like i guess the proper way or the way you're supposed to do it and then if you guys need to look up how to do custom user models it's not like super hard uh but just go online there's a few decent tutorials for that because i don't think i'm going to cover that in that series unless you guys really want that and you leave that as a comment down below but anyways the goal of this video is to make specific to-do lists for specific users so that when different users log into the website, they see different to-do lists, just like, you know, if you're on Facebook, you're going to see different posts, like stuff like that, right? So it's going to be a little bit more custom to each user. And obviously they can save their own to-do list and that'll be saved just for them. And other people shouldn't be able to view that. So what I'm going to do, and I need to do this is inside of our models.py file inside of our main application, I'm going to just add a foreign key to to-do list, which is user. And then that way our users will have a to-do list set where we can view all of the uh, the different to do lists uh, with that user. So to do this, I need to start by importing our user model. So to get that, I'm going to say from Django dot contrib dot auth dot models import user with a capital U. Now what I'll do is just add a foreign key. I'm just going to copy this and just change the names here. Instead of to do list, we'll say user and we'll do user right here. So we'll have user models of foreign key. So now we're just saying that essentially every to do list we create will be linked to some kind of user. Awesome. So now uh, what we need to do is actually make some migrations in our file so that uh, we're going to update our database accordingly to that. Now, you shouldn't run into any issues doing this. Uh, it should just like create the migrations for you. But if for some reason this doesn't work, what you need to do is delete all of your database files. So delete your database file, delete all of the um, everything inside of your migrations folder, including the pie cache, but not the init.py files. And that goes for all of your migration folders. So any migration folder, delete everything except this init.py. And then anywhere you see a pie cache folder, 
delete that and that'll allow you to do the migrations after that so uh now that we've done that what do we need to do next well now when we create a to-do list things are a little bit different so this is where we're creating a to-do list and what we're doing to do that is just creating a new to-do list and saving it in the database but now we need to save the to-do list to a specific user so to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to say response dot user um, dot to do list underscore set. Now, I don't know if this is going to have to be capital or not. So we'll have to play with that in a second. But I think it should just be like that dot create. And in this case, we'll give a name to our to do list and we'll say the name is going to be equal to N. Now, I believe this is how you create it. I'm going to go look to see how we created the item. Yeah, so that is it's a similar way. So we'll test this to see if that's working, but this should now be saving our to-do list to a specific user. Now we can still access our to-do list by doing the slash ID of those to-do lists, but we're going to probably modify this a little bit so that you're only able to access uh, to-do lists that are yours. So that'll mean we'll look at the ID and then we'll see if that's in the user set. And if it is, then we'll show that. Otherwise we'll say like you don't have access to this to-do list or something, but let's first just make sure that we can create them. Okay. So another thing that I'm going to do actually is we've created this. Um, if I go to templates, we've created, um, no, we have not created, but in our base.html, sorry guys, we have this slash view here, right? And this originally, I think I had it linking to two just to test stuff. But what I want to do is actually make this, uh, go to a list of all of our different to do lists. So I've created this slash view. So now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to add a URL inside of our URLs here that is going to be slash view. And what slash view will do is it'll bring us to a list of all of our to do lists. So I'm just going to say the function name will be view. The link will be view and the name will be view. And then what we'll do is we'll create a new, uh, I guess, function inside of views.py and we'll say define view response. And then what we're going to do is we're going to return a render. Of in this case, we'll say response view and or main slash view dot HTML, and then we'll pass it nothing as the context. So now we've done all that, we actually need to create a view template. So I'm just going to make a new file and I'm going to save this as view dot HTML, and I'm just going to extend this from the base template. So extends base dot main slash base dot html and then we will add our blocks so we need that block for the title so we'll say block title like that and then end the block so percent percent and block and then inside here i guess we'll just do like view and then we can copy this and just change the name to uh to content so con content like that and then inside of here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create uh, a for loop that's going to loop through all of the different to do lists for our user and display them. It'll be very, very basic, but we can obviously modify it later. So let's add a for loop. So we'll say for, and in this case, TD, which is Stanford to do list in this case, user dot to do list underscore set. Then what we'll do is we'll end the for loop and and four and then in here we're going to create some links to all of our to-do lists and display them just in little paragraph tags so i'm just going to say p and in this case we'll add the name of our to-do list uh i guess we'll add a link here so we'll say a we'll say href equals in this case slash and we'll say td dot id and then we will end that a tag so slash a and then and the p tag slash p and here we'll just put the name of our to do list, which in this case is simply going to be td dot name. All right, so that should display all of our to do lists in just like a standard, I don't know, like list kind of form, we could make it look nicer. But for now, we're just going to go with that. And yeah, and then we should be able to click on them to access those to do lists. So let me see if this is actually working. So let's run the server. Any errors? Let's see. Uh, no errors. So let's now go back to here and so I'm going to create let's just go to the home page and let's go to view Okay, so view are uh, not running into any issues. But we're obviously not seeing anything So now let's try to create a to-do list. So if I say Tim create new 
and we run into an area no attribute to do list underscore set i thought that was going to happen so let me see now if we need to add the capitals to that or not so inside views uh to do list underscore set maybe that's the issue i don't know we'll see though and then i guess we're gonna have to change inside of our view.html file to be capitals as well now if this doesn't work i'll quickly do a little bit of research and figure this out but let's try it now and let's go back to slash create can continue has no attribute to do list underscore set sorry right, i'll be back in one second guys with the proper attribute name for that all right i am back and with a ton of errors that i had to fix so essentially one of the first errors is we need to go here and change this to be user dot to do list dot all because i was trying to loop through something that's not iterable because this is a different object so just put this all here you don't need the brackets after and leave this as lowercase to do list and then what we need to do is go to models and we need to add these two fields to our uh, foreign key so we have to say related name and we're going to define this as to do list and then null equals true now essentially the related name is going to be the way we access this from the related object which is user so we just change that to do list we say null equals true and then what we're going to have to do to save that is make migrations so you know python manage.py make migrations python manage.py migrate you do that you should be set and then the last thing we have to change is inside views.py is what i've done here is i've created a new to-do list so i said t equals to-do list name equals n exactly what we had before same thing with saving the to-do list except now i said response dot user dot to-do list dot add t and then we can still link back to that id because that id is perfectly valid it still exists so we can see that and everything works fine so that is the fixes that's what we need to do remember that once you change these this models file by adding the related name and the null equals true you need to make migrations to save those changes and then rerun the server so i'll show you now what it looks like so essentially you can see i have two to-do lists that say hello when i go i can add items to the to do list so let's say like item one add item there you go we can check it we can save it all that fun stuff if i go to view um it should be showing me this, but for some reason that's not happening. Um, let's see here. Let me try logging out and logging back in. So let's say slash logout and let's say slash login. And let's go Tim password, sign in view. And there we go. We can see that we have now these popping up. So we have to be logged in to be seeing these. If we are not logged in, we are obviously not going to see anything because we don't have any of these. So now let's try to create another account and add some of our to-do list to that account and then see if it's different than what we had before. So let's say we'll make an account. Let's say the email is bob at techwithtim.net. Let's say the password is the password I've been using consistently. And there we go. Let's hit register. All right, so we don't need to save that, but now let's go to view and we're still seeing hello twice, which is interesting to me. Oh, but it's because we're not logged into uh, that account. So let's do slash login. And then what we'll do here is we'll say Bob and password and login and go to view. And obviously there's nothing there. So let's create a new to do list. Let's go new list, create list. Let's go to view and now we can see that we have new list showing up and that is working now i'm sure this is fairly buggy but this gives you an idea of how you can add things to specific users so you can see them on the web page now obviously we can make it so that you can't uh view other people's to-do lists because for example if i go slash two i can view the hello to-do list even though that's not mine so we'll quickly do that and then i guess we'll probably wrap up after that so let's go to index here now and let's quickly say we'll get the to-do list um, objects we'll get so we'll get the to-do list as an object and we'll just see if that to-do list is in the users list if it's not then we'll just you know get out of that we won't let this happen otherwise we'll do whatever we already have so we'll simply just say if in this case response dot user dot i guess to do list dot all like that but we'll say if ls in that then this is valid otherwise so we'll tab all of this in otherwise we'll simply just return 
we can either give an error or we could just like not let them go to this page and to do that we can just link maybe to the home page or something if they try to do that so i mean you guys can pick what you want to do there but i guess i'll just gonna ring uh link to our home page here so we'll just link to home.html and we'll just say in this case or actually maybe let's instead of going to home let's go to view HTML because then that way they can view their to-do list so maybe that makes more sense so now let's try this so let's try to go to two now refresh and you can see that now it's simply bringing us a new list because well that's not our to-do list so if I go to three you can see new list is valid because that's our to-do list so we're able to view that now this is probably not the most secure way to actually like hide information just with like this if statement and all that but I mean, you guys can mess with that if you want. And this is a very, very basic example. So anyways, that is kind of been it for how to add the to-do list to specific users, how to see that. I know the login and logout system isn't super smooth right now, but you can obviously add that on the side. My main goal with these tutorials was to give you guys kind of the starting blocks on how to do things, ideas on how to go about stuff. I really can't show you possibly everything because it's an infinite amount of stuff that you can do with Django. And with that being said, I will hopefully be doing a deployment tutorial soon. It probably won't be for the next few days, but at some point I definitely will do one and I encourage you guys to remind me and get on me if I'm not doing a deployment one because I will do that at some point. And that has kind of been it for the actual writing code and all of this of the Django tutorial. So I hope you guys enjoyed. If you have any questions or future videos you'd like to see, please let me know in the comments down below and I guess I'll see you in the next video.